George. Commissioner, the next witness is Ms Gibson. But I think Dr Collins. Dr Collins. Ask whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation. Um, to take an affirmation. Confirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes, Dr. Collins. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, is your full name Kate Griffiths Gibson? Oh, sorry. I'm just trying to put this seat down a bit. <laughs> I feel perched. Um... Yes, it is. Yeah, first things first, get yourself comfortable, Ms Gibson, and uh, rather than... <coughs> no, it's not working. All right. <clears throat> I'll just sit forward. You said? It'll be fine. Okay. Now, Dr Collins. I, I think I got the witness's name. Is yes. your business address um, 833 Collins Street, Docklands in Victoria? Yes, it is. And is your occupation general manager home lending at the ANZ Bank? Yes, it is. Um, Ms Gibson, have you received a summons to be here today to give evidence and to produce witness statements? Yes, I have. And do you have a copy of that with you in the witness box? Yes, I do. So I tend to the summons. Uh, summons to Ms Gibson is Exhibit 3.14. Um, Ms Gibson, have you made a witness statement um, uh, under the Commission's uh, nomenclature rubric 3.7 for the purposes of the hearings of the Royal Commission? Yes, I have. And do you have your witness statement with you in the witness box? Yes, I do. Uh, Ms Gibson, are there some um, amendments to be made to your statement by way of correction? Yes, there are. Uh, is the first, could you go please to paragraph 27 on page 11? And on the second line of paragraph 27, after the words, as required, do you wish to insert the words comma, for example, comma? Yes, I do. Could you write that on the statement and just initial in the margin? Is there a further correction to be made in footnote 31 on page 14? Yes. And is the correction to delete the word laptop and substitute the word computer? Yes, it is. Would you make that change and initial? And could I ask you to turn to page 24, uh, table 13? And in the second column where it says financial and then weight 20%, do you wish to insert the figure 10% underneath the figure 20%? In italics, yes, I do. In, in italics or in some way to distinguish it. In the box immediately below that, where you see the figure 40%, do you wish to insert the figure in italics 45%? Yes, I do. And in the box below that, beneath the figure 25%, do you wish to add the number 30%? Yes, I do. And Ms Gibson, is the difference in those numbers that the typed figures are the figures for the, fir the financial customer and process weight in the first half of 2014, while the figures you have just added are for the second half of 2014? That's correct, yes. Thank you. And Ms Gibson, with those corrections, are the contents of your statement true and correct? Um, yes, they are. I'm just making that note here. Commissioner, I tend to the statement in rubric 3.7 and the exhibits there too. Exhibit 3.15 will be the witness statement of Ms Gibson relating to rubric 3-7 and exhibits. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Mr Hope. Thank you, Commissioner. 
Ms. Gibson, you've been the general manager of home lending at ANZ since March of this year? Yes, that's correct. From March 2014 to May 2017, you were the general manager of small business banking at ANZ? Yes, that's correct. And in that role, you were responsible for leading the national team of around 800 small business bankers? Yes, I was. And through your both current and former roles, you've gained a good understanding of ANZ's business lending operations? Yes, I have. And in particular, you have a very detailed understanding of the operations of ANZ's small business team? I have a good understanding of it, yes. Okay. And of the different products that are offered by ANZ's small business banking team? Yes, I do. And of the policies and procedures that apply to work undertaken by ANZ's small business banking team? Yes, I do. And you've been put forward by ANZ as their witness to respond to a particular case study? Yes, I have. And we'll come to the detail of this, but that case study co concerns the lending to purchase a gelato franchise? Yes, it does. All right. And I want to ask you some questions to begin with just about the size of ANZ small business banking operations. As we understand it from your statement, the small business banking team deals with lending to businesses of up to $1 million, is that right? Where the customers have total um, business lending with ANZ of $1 million, yes, that's correct. Sorry, where the customer has total business lending of $1 million with ANZ. So it's not a particular loan is up to $1 million, it's the total size of the lending. Yes, it could be an individual loan up to one million, but if the customer had multiple loans that took them over the one million, then that would move out of small business. Okay. And as at December 2014, ANZ's total lending in Australia was approximately $357 billion. Would it help uh, if I I'm, brought up I'm your sorry, statement? I'm sorry, yeah, I don't actually have any of my statement in front of me. You don't have any of your statement, that's No, I just handed it in, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Now, that probably means you also don't have your exhibits. No, I don't. Perhaps if we can make arrangements to provide the exhibits to you. While that's happening, though, I'll just bring it up on the screen. If we oh, okay. Sorry, bring up Ms Gibson's listening. statement and go to paragraph 20 on page ANZ.999.0073. that is more no, helpful. I think I might be easier on the hard copy if it's page nine. Yes. Yeah. So just if we can <laughs> Thank you. understand these figures. The total lending of ANZ within Australia in December 2014 was approximately $357 billion. Yes, that's correct. And the, what's referred to there as business lending, but I understand means small business lending, yes. was about $12.8 billion. Yes, that's correct. That is to customers with total facilities of under $1 million, total facilities with ANZ under yes. $1 million. And then by December 2017, the total lending of ANZ in Australia had risen to just over $418 billion. Yes. And again, lending to small business had risen to about $14.85 billion. Yes. And if we then bring up paragraph 23, which is over the page, the number of customers that ANZ had within business lending, but I understand again, refers to the small business lending section, rose from 114,263 to 131,446 between 2014 and 2017. 
the number of customers looked after by small business that had business lending, though that's the numbers there. Yes, the total, there are many customers who didn't have lending who were also looked after by small business. This is just the customers with lending. Thank you. And then if we go to paragraph 35 of your statement, which is on page 12, ending dot zero zero seven six. You set out some <coughs> figures showing the change in business lending loans submitted. Again, this is loans submitted as part of the small business section. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. And in 2014, there were 38,251 submitted. And by 2017, that had fallen to 21,619. Yes, that's correct. And the total dollar value of the loan submitted had also fallen from about $5 billion to about $3.5 billion? Yes, that's correct. But the average loan amount had risen from 132000 or almost 133000 to almost 159000 Yes, it had. And then over the page, you've got some figures that deal with the loans actually approved. We see that the number approved has fallen between 2014 and 2017 from 34,000 to almost 19,000. Yes, that's correct. And again, the average loan amount has increased, but the dollar value of those approved has fallen commensurate with the fall in the number approved. Um, I haven't actually looked at why it has, but it's fallen. Yes. All right. And what I'm interested in understanding is just so we can get an understanding of what's happening with small business lending, at least from the perspective of ANZ, what's the reason, as you understand it, for that fall in the number of applications for loans being submitted and approved? The discussions that we had at the time were with regard to the fact that the small business segment had become uh, one that was of interest to a lot of financial institutions. There were a number, it, it became more competitive. There were uh, new entrants into the market by way of fintechs who were also offering lending options to small business customers and we, we've, that was what we put it down to. Thank you. Now, and sorry, when you say, I should just clarify this, when you say discussions at the time, you mean discussions within your team uh, when you were still with small business lending over the last few years, is that right? Yes, I do. And you'd, one of the things you'd obviously be interested in understanding is why do we have such a fall off in the number of applications we're receiving? We're always trying to understand how many applications we're receiving and, um, you know, we... we, we for a variety of reasons, um, one of which being that we needed to work with other operations teams within the bank to tell them how many applications that we expected to come and from a financial forecasting point of view, uh, we wanted to understand what we thought that the financials were going to be and this is obviously one of the inputs to that. And do you recall whether there was consideration as to whether what was happening for ANZ was, as ANZ understood it, reflective of what was happening for the other major banks? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I entirely understand your question. Well, what your figures show is that there was this fall off in the number of loans being sub applied for or submitted for consideration for small business lending between 2014 and 2017. We agree yes. about that. And you've identified that when you consider this internally, the reason that was identified, or the most likely reason perhaps was that there was just increased competition coming from the fintech space and other, other possible lenders? Yes. And did ANZ have any insight as to whether or not its, its experience, which was a drop off in the number of loans being sought <coughs> by small businesses, was reflective of the experience of the other major banks? Well, obviously we, we didn't have um, 
in such knowledge of the other of course I'm not, I'm not this I is was, not a sorry no I, this is just a general market was, question that i'm trying to it understand it was based on the feedback that we would get from our frontline staff that they felt that they were um you know finding that the people that they were talking to had other options and they you know would talk to us about um, particular other banks who might be in market with you know aggressive marketing campaigns particularly um, attractively priced offers and so forth. So anecdotally, it seemed evident that the competition was going up, but as to whether or not other banks were seeing a drop off or an increase if they've gone in, I don't know. That is whether it's, whether this is a loss of customers, small business customers to other major banks or a loss of customers to alternative finance providers was unclear. There is a, a lack of um, you know, clear data about that, so it was, it, we had to deduce it from inference. Right. Now then I want to then move to another general topic, which is ANZ's lending to franchises. Mm -hmm. And you explain at pages seven and eight of your statement in paragraph 14, the distinction between panel franchises and non-panel franchises. Could you just explain that distinction to the Commissioner? Yes, the ANZ had, um, well, I suppose there were um, three types of, of small business applications. Um, those that were general applications and then for certain franchise systems that had um, accreditation with ANZ. We called them accredited franchises and they were on the panel. There were also some franchise um, systems that had um, preferred status who were also on the panel, but that was a, um, that didn't lead to any specifically different treatment of applicants from that system uh, relative to general applications. So an, incredit, an accredited franchise would be one where ANZ was prepared to effectively lend against cash flow up until a certain value? For, uh, for all of our small business customers, under the, um, we would consider lending against cash flow. The distinction for, that was made for the accredited fran franchisees of an accredited franchise system was that we would... Uh, firstly, assess the applications of those um, franchisees against um, specific measures for the system that was accredited. Um, and yes, we would, f in some circumstances, be prepared to lend more than um, the 50% value of the business that we would generally have limited our lending to for non-accredited franchise applicants. So could you, if you wouldn't mind just expanding on that, when, did you say there'd be a 50% limit for non-accredited franchises? So our approach to um, small business applicants who were um, buying into a business was that if the business, uh, look, I'm just picking round numbers. If you were going to buy into a business for 200,000, we were prepared to lend without tangible security but only up to 50% of that price. We would seek to see that the purchaser, the owner, the small business owner, was contributing at least 50% of that purchase price. Um, that ratio was slightly different for some of our accredited franchise systems. It was slightly higher. We were prepared to lend perhaps 60% rather than 50%. And for accredited franchises, you had better insight into the financial state of the franchise? Yes, we did. Because you had required the franchisor to satisfy certain requirements in terms of providing financial information? For the accredited franchise systems, yes, they had to provide that and then we would um, reassess them annually. And then, I'm sorry, did you say reassess them annually? So each year for an accredited franchise system, um, they would provide updated figures to us. And then, in paragraph 15 of your statement, <coughs> you're expa explaining <coughs> the proportion of lending at the moment that is to panel franchises 
franchisees of the total small business lending, and it's about 2.75%. Yes, that's correct. And in paragraph 16, you're explaining the proportion of lending to non-panel franchisees of total small business lending, and it's almost 2%. Yes. And that would suggest then the, uh, roughly about 5% of small business lending that ANZ presently undertakes is to franchisees. It would be to, um, yes. It's pretty rough, I think you say. It each is pretty of these rough. Numbers. There are some limitations with the, the data that we have for the non panel franchisees, but I think indicatively that would be about right. And in terms of the distinction that's drawn at $1 million, are you able to just explain to us why is that the the marker of the level of facilities? Um, it's to do with the um, two things. One, the capital treatment for uh, customers, the lending of the customers under one million, uh, which has to do with versus over, um, and the way that we make credit decisions. So for customers with lending up to one million, the credit decision is done under a retail credit decision approach. Um, over a million dollars, that's in our wholesale decision or judgmental credit decisioning um, approach. Thank you. Now, I want to move then to starting to deal with some aspects of the particular case study that we're, the factual case study we're concerned with, which is, as I indicated before, a gelato shop. Yes. I'm going to just run through first very briefly the nature of what occurred. Ultimately, this lending resulted in a complaint being made by the customers to the Financial <coughs> Ombudsman Service. Yes, it did. And the complaint was in relation to three business facilities that had been issued by ANZ in 2014. Yes, it was. And these facilities had been sought by the company, which was the borrower, for the purposes of purchasing and setting up a new gelato shop business? Yes. And the gelato shop was to be a franchisee? Uh, the, the shop in question was uh, to be a franchise within a franchise system, yes. But that particular franchise wasn't one of ANZ's accredited franchisors? No, it wasn't. And therefore the loan, when it was submitted and assessed, was submitted and assessed as a start-up loan in accordance with ANZ's small business credit requirements? Yes, that's correct. As distinct from being assessed under the standards that might have applied if it was an accredited franchisor? If it was an accredited franchisor, in the scenario of being a greenfield, it would also have been assessed as a start-up, but it would have been assessed as a start-up with reference to the accredited um, franchise credit criteria as well. Yes. Thank you. And the application for business lending by this customer was assessed by ANZ in 2014? Yes, it was. And approved by ANZ in early October 2014? Yes, that's correct. The total amount of the three facilities that were provided was $222,100? Yes, that's correct. And that was made up of, first, a business loan of $150,000? Yes. Second, a business overdraft facility of $34,000? A temporary one, yes. And third, an indemnity guarantee facility of $38,100? Yes. And that, was, that last facility was to pay a rental bo bond required in relation to the shop premises? Um, it wasn't to pay the rental I'm bond, sorry. it was to provide a rental bond, to provide yes. a guarantee as, par as, as yes. the rental bond. And there were three kinds of security that ANZ took to support the facilities? Uh, Perhaps if I just I run through I think there was actually four. But ANZ took a second registered mortgage over an investment property owned by one of the directors of the company? Yes, it did. And next, a general security agreement over all of the present and future acquired property of the company? Yes. And finally, personal guarantees and indemnities from each of the directors of the company? Yes. And was there another type of... No, sorry, I was counting both the directors' guarantees. Oh, each is a separate yeah. security. Now, in the complaint that was made to the Financial Ombudsman Service by 
the directors in 2016, they contended that ANZ should not have approved the facilities because the company did not have the capacity to service them. Um, I think there was a number of components of the complaint. I don't recall it all. Um, if we could go to the complaint, I'm happy to. That's right. Well, why don't we just do this by reference to particular paragraphs of your okay. statement. If we bring up... We go to page 41, which is ANZ.999.009.0105. Paragraph 158. Mm -hmm. ANZ was notified of a FOS complaint on the 12th of April 2016. So this is the complaint I want to yes. talk about. This complaint was concerned with whether ANZ should have approved the facilities? Yes, there were a number of elements of the complaint. I just wasn't sure which one you were referring to. Right. But one of the elements was that the company didn't have the capacity to service. Effectively, it was a complaint about whether the lending should have been made in the first place. I'm, actually, I'm sorry, I can't recall what that actually was. I'd recall some of the elements. If I could have a look at the exhibit and check. Okay, if we go to <coughs> tab 59. to a document that should have the doc ID ANZ.800.470.1637. I'm sorry, which exhibit are we in? There may be some difference in what the exhibit numbers are, but if we can bring up the document, which is ANZ.800.470.1637. Is that, are you able to read that, Ms Gibson? Would you prefer to try oh, to nice. find it in your hard copy volume? Do you have a look at about tab 59? Yes, it's not 59, but... Perhaps it's... Might be. Oh, so I'm sure try 60. So I know that the, the um, customer had, there were certain elements of the complaint with regards to the loan. Um, I recall that he had concerns about whether or not we should have taken security and he had, taught, had concerns about whether or not he'd been provided with appropriate advice. I just don't recall that he specifically said that the company was unable to service the loan. So I'm sorry, and I can't see that on here either. Oh, I see. And if we go over the page to the dispute summary... I understand what you're saying. You're saying here the customer is making a complaint, which is I was still given that loan, which I could not afford to repay. Yes. So I borrowed more money to make the repayments. Yes. So his his complaint was he couldn't repay the loan, but not that the that we had the company had not been able that we shouldn't have lent because the company <coughs> couldn't afford to repay. His point was that he couldn't now afford to repay the loan. Right, now the, the question of serviceability, that was one that was considered by FOS? Yes, it was. Right, and ANZ has a, had a position as to serviceability? Yes, we did. And it, if we just work through the process, FOS issued a recommendation in response to the complaint? They did. And that recommendation was in favour of the customer? Yes, it was. And ANZ, and is it fair to say one of the things at least that FOS concluded was that in approving the loan, ANZ failed to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in assessing whether the company borrower had the ability to repay the loans? That was part of their finding, I believe, yes. And ANZ did not accept that recommendation? No, we didn't agree with it. And FOS proceeded to issue a formal determination in relation to the customer's complaint? Yes, they did. And the formal determination was also in favour of the customer? Yes, it was. 
and ANZ has complied with the formal determination? Yes, we have. But notwithstanding that, it remains the position that from ANZ's perspective, it disagrees with the conclusions that were drawn by FOS? Um, yes. All right. And I want to have a look at some issues in relation to the determination as to the making of the loan to the company and ANZ's perspective on the cash flow forecasts. Do you recall that one of the findings made by FOS in both the recommendation and determination was that ANZ had relied on projected cash flow forecasts that were overly optimistic? Yes, that was their finding. And in reaching that conclusion, FOS found that when compared with performance benchmarks for the gelato and ice cream industry that are published by the ATO, the cash flow forecast relied on by ANZ in assessing the loan was overly optimistic. That was their conclusion, yes. And therefore unlikely to be achieved. Well, they um, referred to the ATO benchmarks with respect to the cost of goods sold percentage. I'm um, sorry, Ms Gibson, do you mind keeping <coughs> your voice up a sorry. bit more? Um, yeah, I believe that um, in FOS's determination, they concluded that the sales figures were overly optimistic. Lynn. reference to the cost of goods sold percentage that is shown on the ATO website. Um, that's not the only assumption that was in the cash flow forecast. Sorry, that's not the only assumption? No, there are, there are many assumptions in the cash flow forecast. Um, the ATO's website references the 30% cost of goods sold. It also makes a comment that that's the best indicator of turnover and they have concluded therefore that the sales figures in the cash flow forecast in the business plan were overly optimistic, but they're basing that entirely on the cost of goods sold percentage. I understand. And just, I'm sorry, I think you said the ATO determined, but you mean FOS determined. I'm sorry. ATO's website is talking about that. Yes. yes. FOS also said that the um, sales figures were overly optimistic with reference to that figure. Yes. And the, we're going to come to this in due course, but the forecasts of cash flow, they were in a business plan document that was submitted with the loan application? Yes, they were. And ANZ contended before FOS that it was reasonable to rely on the information contained in the business plan? I'm sorry, A before FOS? ANZ contended to FOS that it was reasonable to rely on the information contained in the business plan. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact wording of our letter back, but we, we, dis we disagreed that the, were they were necessarily optimistic. All right, perhaps so. if we forget for a moment about FOS and just the present okay. position of ANZ, which you explain in your statement, ANZ's position remains that it was reasonable to rely on the cash flow forecasts in the business plan. Our position is that we looked at the serviceability relying on the cash flow. We also looked at the serviceability with a, um, a stressed version of the cash flows and could also see serviceability and in so much as we had done that, yes, we believed it was reasonable. All right. Well, perhaps we'll come to the business plan in due course and then we might be able to understand this a bit better. And what I'd just like to make sure I've understood is if, if it had been unreasonable to rely on the cash flow forecasts in the business plan, would ANZ accept that it was in breach of its obligations under the code of baking practice? I think if we believed that the serviceability had not been able to be demonstrated, then yes, then we would not have met the obligations under the code of baking practice. Right. Now, you've exhibited and identified a number of ANZ's policies in relation to applications for small business lending in 2014? Yes, I have. And those were the policies that applied when ANZ assessed and approved the loan to this company? Yes. And 
one of the sets of lending policies that applied in 2014 is a document called Credit Principles. Yes. I'd like to take you to that. That's exhibit number five. <coughs> and it should be ANZ. Oh, there we go. It's up on the screen already. I want to take you through some parts of these documents and then ask you at a general level how you'd expect these policies to be applied. So you see the second credit principle is only lend what the customer has the capacity and ability to repay. Yes. And if we go over the page then to the page dot three two nine three you'll see under that second credit, credit principle only lend what the customer has the capacity and ability to repay that there is a heading that is background? Yes. And the first part of the background is that ANZ ought to understand a customer's true debt servicing position and it's vital to assess repayment ability. Yes. And What's also explained is it is in neither the customer's nor ANZ's best interest for customers to take on more debt than the customer can manage based on the customer's environment. Yes. And then you'll see a heading requirements. Yes. And the second bullet point is apply methodologies and tools which assist in determining a customer's capacity to repay, taking into account potential changes in external factors and or circumstances. Yes. And if you come down to the seventh bullet point, you'll see for business lending, there's a series of points that are explained, understand and assess the customer's business strategy, understand the drivers of the customer's cash flow, analyse historical financial data and assess projected cash flow as the primary repayment source, assess the customer's capacity to handle the various business risks by examining factors such as the customer's management skills, experience, planning ability and management information systems, draw conclusions on the customer's capacity to repay based on the overall strength of underlying cash flows and the customer's ability to repay debt over the term. Is your view, having looked at this particular case, that ANZ complied with this part of the requirements in relation to this customer? <coughs> I think that the what is set out here is at a high level for the group and it encompasses all of the business lending we do everywhere. Um, <coughs> there were some concerns I had with the way the application was handled, but overall, yes, I do. Right. Would you be able to explain to us what were the concerns you had about the way the application was handled? As I think I said in my statement, there are a number of instances where data was not input correctly into the system. And you know, from, from my part, I think that it should have been. So. Perhaps if we just walk through that. So one of the issues was that there was, there had been an earlier application that had been put in a related application which contained different financial information from the application that was ultimately relied upon by, for this loan? Uh, there had been an earlier application by the individuals with relation to a different business, yes. And I'd understood one of the concerns that you had was that that difference hadn't been picked up in the, in the course of assessing the later, the final application. Um, there were differences between the application that was provided the first time round um, and the applicant, and I'm, I'm sorry, because there were six different applications here, I, I realise I'm not using any of the names, the, the, first, yes. the first two applications that were submitted with respect to a yoghurt business, um, the, there were differences between that application and the one that was later submitted with respect to the gelato business, yes. Perhaps if we do it by reference to paragraph 177 of your statement, which is ANZ.999.009.0108. I'm 
I'm sorry, what paragraph was that? Paragraph 177. Okay. Yes. It might be easier if we just run through your specific concerns. <coughs> The one you were referring to, which is the difference in figures, I think mm. that's 177 subparagraph C. Yes. Well, there were a number of times where there were differences in figures. Yes. So the the one that I'm referring to in C is that we, um, you know, in the process of going through this file and preparing for this statement, we became aware of the fact that we had two application forms, um, one for the first business that the customers were seeking to purchase and one for the second business that they were seeking to purchase. Um, and those application forms both have the same date on them, but they have different figures on them. And that was not apparent to either the banker or the assessor who were handling the loan that was eventually approved and drawn down by the customer um, due to some challenges with our systems um, and there not being a process requirement that they search for such an application and there's no evidence that the customer advised them that there had been a prior one. And has that process issue in terms of not searching for earlier applications been something that's been addressed? Yes, it has. It's been addressed in two ways. We have a new origination system for small business loans that mean that the both the bankers and the assessors can now see any prior applications that have been made by the borrower. Um, they are also able to search easily for prior applications from individuals on individuals' names, um, and they are able to see the information for those prior applications on that system. Um, and the assessors are also directed to give regard to any recent applications that may have been received by the borrower. And then in 177 subparagraph B, you refer to slightly different issue, which is the lease expense and personal overdraft were not considered in the capacity to service analyses conducted by the assessor? Yes. And do you regard that as a, a system issue that has now been addressed or really is just a one-off failing in terms of leaving something out in the consideration of serviceability? I think it's a combination of a system failing um, and um, human error. The system in, in place at the time relied on uh, the banker to put the liability into the liability field. So even if a payment was um, put into the payment field on the, the financial statement of position, what the assessor was looking at in terms of sensitising consumer liabilities relied on the liability to have been completed. Um, so the fact that those liabilities hadn't been completed by the banker was overlooked by the assessor and therefore they didn't take that into account in doing their assessment. And then the last point first in time is that the statement of position, which I think, I'm not sure if you've got an unredacted version in front of you, I imagine you do. If you go to paragraph 177 of your statement. Um, do you, sorry, did you want me to look at the statement yeah, of position? I think if you, oh no, you don't need to look at the statement of position, okay. just if you look at the unredacted version, because as yes. you say. Oh, sorry, it mentions the business. You yes, You need to okay. figure out which one it's referring to. Yes. And that, as I understand it, is the statement of position for the business that was ultimately funded. Yes. And so the statement of position for the business that was ultimately funded was lacking in detail and there were no contemporaneous written records reflecting the information entered by the, bar by the banker into the, is that small business lending system? It is, yes. All right. And that, do you regard that as a one-off issue or a process system failure issue? That I would regard as an error by the banker. It was our expectation that the numbers on a statement of position in an application should be entered into the system um, to reflect the application. If there was some reason why those numbers had <coughs> changed, um, they should have made notes to that effect on the system to indicate why. Um, you know, and you know, ideally should have actually had a 
statement recompleted and that more closely reflected um, the actual position of what they were putting into the system. And if we just return then to the cash flow forecast, as I understand it, insofar as ANZ relied upon the cash flow forecast in the business plan, you don't think there was any issue with that being done? Um, well, there was some concerns that could have been um, raised with the customer about the cash flow forecast. I don't know if they were or weren't because I haven't seen any notes in the files to suggest that they were or weren't discussed. Um, the approach that the assessor took to the cash flow forecast was to look at um, the serviceability, taking it at face value. And um, then the assessor did what um, she termed a break even analysis where she effectively stressed the business, if you like, in terms of the cash flows and dropped that profit figure to zero and she reduced the owner's salary and she still saw serviceability and therefore on that basis she made a judgment that it was serviceable. And just on that last, the stress test that you've referred to, the stress test is being able to service the loan on the basis that the profit of the business is zero and the owner is taking over ha only half of the salary that had been projected in the, in the forecasts? Uh, that's after they've paid for the business expenses, yes. Yes. And then could they still service the loan? Well, yes, because the loan payments come out before you calculate the profit figure. But the the serviceability calculation that was done then wasn't done by reference only to whatever was being earned by the business owner from the business, was it? No, at that stage she was looking at a combined serviceability picture for the business and both the directors. Yes, so she was looking at serviceability based on this stress testing of the business if you added in also the salary being earned by the other spouse who wasn't working in the business. He wasn't the main person working in the business, but he was. He had indicated he would spend some time in the business, so he was a director of the business. It wasn't done by reference to the salary that he was going to be earning out of the business? No. It was done by reference to his salary from his other employment? Yes, when we looked at the holistic picture, it was with reference to his salary and also his, ex well, his income and expenses outside of the business, yes. Was there testing done as to whether or not the business could service the loan based on just taking the income from the business? Um, there's no um, notes in the file that explicitly call that out. I think the... Uh, the fact that the business was showing a healthy profit, um, I would take it that most of the bankers would not go to the effort of filling in a column just to say, yes, the business can service when it clearly can because it's profitable. Understood. They've moved straight on to looking at what would happen, what, what what's the holistic lending for the directors and the business. Mm -hmm. And in relation to this loan, can I just make sure we've, we're on the same page about this? The husband and wife that were going to be operating the business, they hadn't previously worked in relation to frozen yoghurt or gelato or anything like that? Not to my knowledge, no. They were proposing to purchase this franchise as a new business? Yes, they were. It wasn't an established franchise that they were going to take over? No, it wasn't. And it wasn't a franchise chain that was established in Australia? No, it wasn't. And they were going through a broker <coughs> in order to obtain the loan? Yes, they were. And the broker was dealing directly with the ANZ banker? Yes. And can we go to... 
exhibit 30 of your statement, which is ANZ.800.534.0008. Um, I'm sorry, what was the document ID? It was ANZ dot, actually, in this case, it should start with ANZ dot 800 dot 534 dot 0041. No, I... Are your exhibit my numbers exhibits out by one? are all out by one, yes. So one. just, I'll... It's possible my that's exhibits okay. are out I'll, by one. No, no, I assume yours are right. I'll add, add one to anything you say. Um, yes. Okay, well, let's, can we just start with ANZ.800.534.0041? Yes. And have you got, just while that's coming up on the screen, have you got an unredacted version in front of you, Ms Gibson? So I you, do, yes. Oh, good. And so while this is coming up, this is a chain of emails from what appears to be the broker to the relevant ANZ banker? Yes, it is. Just wait for that to come up. So this is a chain of emails and starting from the bottom, there's an email from the broker to the ANZ banker, which is an email in relation to the customer's application. And the last document is a business plan for which there's given a Dropbox link. Yes, that's correct. And that's sent on the 8th of August, 2014. Yes. And then that seems to get forwarded again by the broker to the ANZ banker on the 26th of August, 2014. Yes. And the banker responds to the broker on the 26th of August, 2014, saying we do not have access to sites like Dropbox due to security limitations. Is it possible to have those documents sent as attachments? Yes. And there's then an email back from the broker to the banker attaching the business plan and you'll see it says, attached, mate, my neck is online here. I've lost a couple of deals from the franchiser as well. Please let me know. Already explained they had consultant ANZ manager and knew this is a deal. Did this, when you read this, did this seem like an unusual email to you for a communication between the broker and the banker? It didn't strike me as overly right. unusual. And then if we go to ANZ.800.534, .0007. See, then this is, again, you and I can see the unredacted parts. It appears that the somebody from the franchisor is sending an email to the broker attaching the business plan with cash flow and reduced file size? Yes. And then that's forwarded in turn by the broker to the ANZ banker? Yes. And then that's the document that we then have, which is ANZ.800.534.0008. Yes, that's correct. And you've read through the business plan? Yes, I have. And. When you read through the business plan, did you have any concerns about the bank having lent money to a borrower to buy into this business? Beyond the three points that you've noted already? Um, I had some questions that I would have asked about the business plan, but they didn't um, immediately lead me to think that there was an issue having lent to the customer, no. Right. And what were the types of customers that you would have wanted, I'm sorry, questions that you would have wanted to ask the customer? Um, 
I think on reading through the business plan, um, it's, it isn't, um, I think, uncommon for a franchise or to work with a franchisee on a business plan because they necessarily need to provide information about the franchise. The language in the business plan um, does strike me in a few places as pretty generic to the franchise system and in other places it's quite specific to the customers and their particular circumstances. So I would um, have expected that the banker would have wanted to check that the customers had been involved in the business plan development. The, if I think about the sorts of things that we suggest to customers that they think about having in their business plan, there were a number of things in their in the business plan that covered that off. They had looked at the, um, the market for ice cream stores. They had looked at the demographics for the area where they were proposing to open the shop. Um, they had a pretty detailed cash flow forecast in there. Um, they had considered seasonality um, in the way they put those um, figures together. Um, the questions in my mind were that the revenue figure, while detailed, didn't make it clear what assumptions that they had made in putting those figures together. Um, I think the assumption a reader would take was that that had been heavily informed by the franchisor and um, I would have wanted to understand what it was based on. And do you think, do you have a view as to whether it's the responsibility of a banker to raise these types of issues with the customer? It's certainly our expectation that when a banker is um, going to submit a loan for a start-up loan, they need to get a business plan, they need to get a cash flow forecast, and they need to form an opinion as to the reasonableness of that. Um, and I think it would be difficult to do that without having a conversation with the customer about the, the figures in there. Perhaps if we have a look at some elements of the business plan. If we go over to page three of the business plan, which is anz.800.534.0010, and the business plan describes the franchise as a multi-awards winning gelato brand. Brand, you see that? Yes, I do. And says, after the successful business in New Zealand, the franchise has now landed in Australia to offer franchises. <coughs> yes. And it's apparent, isn't it, that this franchise has not to date operated in Australia? I think that's clear, yes. And if you look down the page to capital requirements, it explains the purpose is to open the franchise store? Yes. And it's, maybe there's some over-redaction going on here, Commissioner, which is frustrating, but I'll work through it as best I can. There's a figure that's given for total setup cost. Okay, that's oh. not redacted on mine. Oh, it's not redacted it? on yours? In any event, so there's a total setup cost of three hundred and forty thousand dollars. Yes, that's correct. And fifty percent of that is to be contributed by the owners, and the balance by debt funding. <laughs> I'm sorry, by equity, no debt funding. Yes. And the there's then a description of the personal characteristics of the borrowers. Yes. And. The director is said to have experience of running the retail store in Australia and overseas. Yes. But not a retail store for this franchise. No. And indeed, was it a retail store in relation to food at all? It's not clear to me. There are later notes um, in the file that have reference to her having worked um, in a food store. 
um, I'm not sure if I can name it or not, but um, it, it wasn't an ice cream store, but it was a food store in a different franchise system. All right. And then if we go over the page to page four of the business plan, see again that the franchise is described as a new emerging gelato brand born in New Zealand and now arrived in Australia to offer retail franchises. And if we then go over the page to page five of 33, <coughs> it explains that the franchise has two, four types of models and the particular model that's going to be used in this case is a kiosk store in Westfield Shopping Centre. Yes. And if we then go over the page to the page dot zero zero one nine. So I should actually go back a page, which is dot zero zero one eight. I think you spoke before about the idea of, did you describe it as generic language or general language? I, I think that may have been the phrase I used, yes. And is this the type of thing you're talking about where it has a mission, which is that the franchise will be a great place to eat, combining an intriguing atmosphere with excellent, interesting food. I think that whole paragraph sounds like it could have been put into any of the business plans for the franchise system, yes. Yes. Or indeed, any franchise system to do with food. Possibly, yes. And then if you come over the page to dot zero zero one nine, and we have the objective. And again, this is very generic language at the beginning. The purpose of the business is because of our passion about food industry, vegetarian product, to introduce the missing ingredients. As I say, quality and services, which are rare in majority of the stores these days. And that's the type of language you're talking about. Yes, it may well be what the owners believe, but it's not clear that it's specific to this store, no. No, and as we know, the plan was sent by the franchisor. Yes. And it's unclear whether the franchisees had any involvement in preparing it. Um, I think there are a few references to the, the customers that suggest that they had had a conversation at a minimum with the franchisor, yes. But, yes. but, it's, but I think there's it's nothing that suggests they prepared it. From scratch? Certainly not. Well, indeed, there's other than there's information about them, but there's nothing to actually suggest that they were involved in the preparation. They didn't put pen to paper or type on a computer or anything like that to prepare the document. I can't tell other than that the franchise all sent it to the broker, which we know. I can't say who prepared it. And then there's set out the store's objectives for the first three years of operation, which are... Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether they're redacted on your version, but in any event, very general. Do you agree with that? Um, some of them are specific because they speak to the assumptions that were put into the cash flow forecast and some of them are general. I see. And then if you go over the page to page dot zero zero two zero, it explains that the store is to be developed as a standalone, fully fitted out gelato production and sales facility. But it's apparent, isn't it, from the redacted part that you and I can see, but others can't, that it's going to be a kiosk? Yes. In the middle of a walkway at a Westfield shopping centre? Yes. But I think the picture, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the picture that's shown and it looks like a kiosk to me. So. Yes, and then it, but you also, if you've got the unredacted version, yes. you can see... Where it was going to be cited, yes. All right. And then if we come over to page dot zero zero two two, This is the start-up summary that explains where the $340,000 comes from. Mm-hmm. And it explains that the store has been identified and will open 
in between October and November 2014, notwithstanding that that's redacted. That's not subject to a non-publication direction. Yes. And then if we go to the page dot zero zero two five. This is the, I think you referred to some consideration of the market before. Um, my recollection, I would have to um, re-find it, was that there had been um, reference to an Ibis World uh, report on the ice cream and that there was discussion about this area of Westfield and the growth in the demographics. Can I just point out a few things to you and then ask for how you think a ANZ banker ought to have reacted? You see there's a heading children, student and families and it says the perfect place for children and families, kids and parents will, kids and parents will enjoy the products while families will come for an accommodative menu and friendly service. You see that? I do. And then you see happy couples. The store will have an intimate, romantic, sophisticated atmosphere that encourages people to bring dates and to have couples arrive. Yes. It's a Westfield kiosk. I know. I, I just I suppose the starting point is, do you expect your ANZ bankers to read the business plan? Yes, I do. And do you expect that they would raise these types of issues, which is, it's, this is an entirely generic document, in large part unrelated to what is actually going on? Yes, I would. And if they have, in this case, there's no record of that having been done? No, there's not. And do you think, having not done that, that raises a question about whether or not they've acted as a diligent and prudent banker? There's no notes as to whether the conversation occurred, but I don't know whether the conversation occurred or not. One of the issues I'm interested in exploring with you is the level of responsibility as between the borrower and the banker. Because we can look at this and see that this is inconsistent within the, own doc within the document itself mm. as to what is going to happen. Ought that be a responsibility, in your view, that lies only on the borrower to recognise this inconsistency, or is it also a responsibility that is shared with the banker? I think it is shared, and I think that because it is, it is important that the banker forms an opinion as to the reasonableness of the cash flow forecasts and whether the customers have understood the business that they're getting into is going to, and you know who the target market are, is part of that. Um, I suppose the challenge is that we are not. That I'm not clear what conversation happened with the banker, and I'm not. I'm not of the opinion that in every case the business plan would need to be taken back and edited to reflect and updated if the banker formed an opinion that the cash, you know, that they did understand and they hadn't updated the language, then they could proceed. But I agree with you that the bank needs to form their own opinion. And on your review of this business plan, what is the opinion that you would have expected the bank to form? I think that the bank the banker should have had a conversation with the customers to make sure that they understood the business. There are notes at the time indicating that he had had conversations but not what those conversations should have been about. And I think, um, as I said before, many of the things that we would look for in a business plan are in this document. And if the banker had formed the opinion that the customers had had sufficient involvement in it to understand it, then I do think it's a reasonable, um, it's reasonable to accept it. Is it something where one of the risks, um, I'll withdraw that and put it a different way, looking at this document, 
and bearing in mind the fact that the borrowers have not previously worked in relation to this franchise and have not and one of them is not going to work full time in the business and neither of them appear to have owned a business themselves before. You agree with those things? That that's uh, not a, a business of this scale, no. The, one of the owners had run a small business online from home, but I don't think it was on the scale of this. So Nothing like... It wasn't a retail operation no. or anything like that. On the face of this document, there appears to be a risk that the borrower is being taken advantage of by the franchisor and the broker. Do you agree with that? Um, I'm not... I'm not sure that that is exactly where my mind would jump. I think it, there is always a risk that people who are entering into a small business do so without as full an understanding of the business you know, as, as they might have. Um, I'm, I'm aware that the customer has alleged that that was the case, but I don't think that it's immediately obvious from the document that that is what's going on. And then if you come over the page to dot zero zero three three. So you see this is a list of assumptions and then some indicative numbers around what the how the business's cash flow is calculated. Yes. And then over the page at dot zero zero three four, there's then projected cash flows and profit and loss <coughs> forecasts based on the existing store sales. Yes. Now we know there were no existing stores in Australia. Yes. So at best, this could be projections based on cash flows in stores in other countries. Um, there's a number of ways it could have been done. It could have been a cash flow from another country. It could have been a model where they looked at the volume of ice creams and other products sold in the New Zealand stores and resetted those price points to the Australian market. We don't know because the assumptions are not spelt out. And would you expect those assumptions to be spelt out for the bank? I think in um, ideally, yes, they would have been. Right. Do you think there's a problem with ANZ accepting the forecasts without those assumptions being spelt out? I think it's ideal that they are. I think for the bank to make it something that's a mandatory requirement is also challenging. In, why is that? Well, because of the range of different businesses that apply to ANZ. Um, I think once you become prescriptive about exactly what has to be in there, you, you, know, you are making it challenging for people who are starting businesses that don't have that data to meet your requirements and you run the risk that if you have a very prescriptive mandatory requirement that people who can't meet that um, then can't access lending or may just make the numbers up. So it may make up the detail, may make yes. up the detailed assumptions. Yes. What I'm wondering about though is that's the risk with these numbers, isn't it? That they don't, we can't test the assumptions. Yes, that's a risk. And that they've just been, at least to some extent, or perhaps entirely made up. It's impossible to know. It's not possible to know where, how they've been arrived at, no. And, and whether there's... Uh, you make the point, you can think of at least two different ways that they might have forecast cash flows based on existing store sales from overseas. Yes. But what those stores are, what countries, presumably they're in New Zealand, but 
how it's gone about, how any of this has gone about is just not apparent on the face of the document. No. And I'm, what I'm trying to tease out is your view, I think, and I don't want to be unfair to you, is it's not ideal that the banker accepted this without teasing those things out? I'm not sure if the banker did or didn't. There's nothing in the notes to the file to suggest that he had that conversation. There's nothing he's put in the notes to the file for the assessor to look at to provide them with any indication that he's had that conversation. So it, it, it's fair to assume that perhaps it didn't happen. I just don't know. Well, I think the, you've spoken to the banker, haven't you? Yes. And the banker's told you he didn't speak to the franchise or? He did tell me that, yes. And did you ask the banker whether he did anything to test the basis of these projected cash flow forecasts? Um, actually, I don't think I did, no. Okay. But in any event, he didn't speak to the... I'm sorry, I, I may have... Did I say he didn't speak to the franchisor? That's yes, who he, he didn't did. speak to, yes. Yeah. Without speaking to the franchisor, it's difficult to see how he could have satisfied himself as to the basis of these numbers. Well, again, I don't, I don't know what conversations did or didn't happen, but it would not have been unreasonable for him to have asked the customer and the customer to have provided that information. But he didn't record it? He didn't record it, no. And it wasn't provided to the credit assessor? No, it was not. And so, therefore, both the credit assessor and the banker proceeded without the information? Yes. And, again, to return to the question I've asked a few times, is that a failure to exercise diligence and prudence, in your view, of a reasonable banker? No, I don't think it is, because, again, that we ask them to form a view of the reasonableness, and these revenue figures don't seem to me... I mean, I, I'm not someone who looks at these every day of the week, like assessors do. Um, I think if the assessor had looked at these and had felt that they were wildly out of um, out of kilter with <coughs> what they were seeing, you know, every day of the week in looking at at business applications, they would have asked questions. Well, can I just test that a moment? Just back of the envelope numbers. Take the July number, say forty five thousand monthly sales. Assume seven day week operation. Uh, how many units at $5 a unit are they selling each day? Um, it's a lot of units, isn't so it? So I did look at that, Commissioner. Um, I used 60 hours, I think 63 hours based on the roster. Um, I actually went and found a blog about ice cream prices, so it's more like $7 an ice cream. And um, it came out based on them doing 85% of their revenue over the counter. Um, and I was using about 55,000, which was the average. It was about, I think, 23 ice creams an hour that they would have to sell. In July? Sorry, no, that was 55 was the average for the whole year. So it would be less in July, I agree. Can I... Unfortunately, Ms Gibson, we're going to need to break in a moment. Can I just ask yeah. you one other thing? I'm sorry, Commissioner, did you want to ask any more questions no, no. about that? Just if you go to the to page dot zero zero three eight. <coughs> so this is the hypothetical budget that's arrived at for the profit and loss projections. <coughs> mm-hmm. And you see the bottom line is return to owner, which is said to be wages and profit. See yes. That? And you see in order to arrive at that, that is calculated by adding back the GST of almost $30,000. Yes. Can you think of any way in which GST would be added back in order to arrive at the return to the owner? No. 
And you see then the net profit before tax is said to be $175,000. Yes. And then, so that's the net profit of the company as we read it before tax. Yes. And after adding back GST. I think so. I have to say I have spent more time on an earlier page, which were the figures that we actually used in the assessment. I don't believe these figures were used anywhere in ANZ's assessment of in the loan. In ANZ's assessment, I understand. And what I'm interested in is this then is suggesting to the owner that the return to the owner will be two hundred, almost $226,000 based on the owner's wages plus the before tax profit of the company, which includes adding back $30,000 of GST. Yes, it, it doesn't seem an accurate number. And it just seems impossible, doesn't it? It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, as I said, I'm sorry, I haven't looked, spent a lot of time on this. I, on the face of looking at it, it doesn't seem like a correct number. Is the number that ANZ relied upon, if you go back to page dot zero zero three five, the net profit before tax shown down in the bottom corner of 140, almost $142,000. Yes, that is. All right. And notwithstanding that that's the number that ANZ was ultimately going to rely upon, would you expect the banker to be raising issues with the putative borrower about this figure of $226,000 and where it comes from and what the borrower's expectations are? Um, if the banker had read that detail, then yes, I think it would be reasonable for them to ask a question about it. Because, and I want to be fair to you, the counter view might be that's not the banker's job. The banker's job is to assess the loan and it's the borrower's job to make a decision as to whether the borrower wants to borrow the money and start a business. And if the borrower makes a hopeless bet, that's the risk for the borrower. I think in, in a case where the bank is lending money to them, it's a risk for the bank as well. But I agree with you that the decision to invest in a small business is the decision of the small business owner. I think, Commissioner, would it be possible to... Yeah, if we've got a Stand. witness who's uh, taken a day off work and has got to be back at work tomorrow. Yes. Ms Gibson, I'm sorry, we're going to have to ask you to come back tomorrow okay. uh, at uh, 09.45. That's fine. I will be here. Thank you. Now, Mr Hodge, are we changing horses at the bar table, etc.? We are, Commissioner. Yes. So right. we well, I'll come back and give you two minutes to sort Thank yourselves you. out. <laughs> Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, we'll continue now with the evidence of Ms Gibson. So yes. if Ms Gibson could return to the witness box. Thank you very much, Ms Gibson. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Ms Gibson, We were exploring at the end of yesterday afternoon some issues that touch on the question that I want to explore more fully with you this morning, and that is at what point in time the bank has to say, this is just the personal responsibility of the borrowers in order to make the decision that they're going to make to enter into this business loan. And I want to explore two different elements of that with you. One is, 
some issues in relation to whether just looking at the documents, there would be questions that would be raised in the mind of the banker as to whether it made a lot of sense to enter into this business, and we'll come to that second. The first thing that I want to deal with is a more direct issue for the, from the perspective of the banker, which is assessing cash flow and the projected cash flow and how the banker ought to go about doing that. So with that introduction, can we bring back up the document which is exhibit tab 30 to your statement? <coughs> And if we go to page dot zero zero three four, I'm sorry, it's ANZ dot eight hundred dot five three four dot zero zero three four. Do you recall we were looking at this document yesterday and the things that we'd observed were that the projected cash flows and profit and loss forecasts are said to be based on the existing store sales? Um, yes. And you'd identified that it's unclear what that means in the sense that it's unclear whether that means they've taken foot traffic in some other stores and then somehow projected that over into Australia, whether they've just directly imported sales from some other stores or how exactly they've gone about this exercise? Yes, I, I don't see that in here. And we'd agreed, I think, that there's no indication on the face of the documents that you've reviewed that this is something that was delved into or explained in writing by either the franchisor or the borrowers? I haven't been able to see that, no. Okay. And your expectation would be, as I understand it, that for the banker and also the credit officer responsible for assessing this, that they would make some assessment as to whether the loan could be repaid based on the forecast cash flows? Yes. And what I'd like to understand is, what would you expect the diligent and prudent banker to do in a case such as this in assessing the reliability of the cash flows? My expectation is that they would have uh, looked for indications that they, the business plan had taken into account appropriate expenses, um, that they would have looked at the revenue and had um, some understanding of how the revenue had been arrived at, and that they uh, would look for obvious signs that it hadn't been thought through in the context of how the business would operate. Um, and the most uh, common thing there is if you don't see seasonality in the revenue figure, for instance, um, then that would be a flag that that's not really a cash flow forecast, that's more of a budget. And so in this case, where we can just look at the monthly sales trend and see it's up in January and the hottest month, it's down in June and July, the coldest month, that's at least something that indicates seasonality? Yes. And would that be sufficient then, in your view, for a banker to be satisfied that there were no obvious signs that there were problems with the cash flows? I, I think so, yes. Okay. And in terms of the <coughs> source data that was involved, would you expect that the banker or the credit officer would make a request for the source data? Not specifically, no. I would, um, as I said, I would expect them to have had a conversation with the customer about the business plan um, as to asking for the underlying source data. They might ask for that, but I don't see it. It's, it's mandatory to do so. 
I'm sorry. Can I ask you to keep your voice I'm up? I'm sorry. Further? Yeah. Thank you. I think you, what I heard you to say then was you don't think it's mandatory for them to do so. Is that right? I think the, um, what I was trying to convey is what, uh, what is being done by the credit officer is an exercise in judgment. They need to form an opinion we provide guidance on the sorts of things we think they should take into account, but we're not prescriptive about exactly what has to be um, sourced beyond saying that they do need to provide a business plan, they do need to provide cash flow forecasts, and the bank officer and credit officer need to have formed an opinion that they're reasonable. And so if we, can we put this document on one side of the screen and bring up on the other side of the screen exhibit number five, which is ANZ.800.399.3292. And can we go to the second page? So you recall, we looked at this document yesterday, Ms Gibson, this is the credit <coughs> principles that ANZ applies. Yes. And I recall you made the point yesterday, this applies effectively to all credit that ANZ is offering. This is a group-wide policy, yes. And it would have applied to this particular lending that we're talking about in this case as well? The, at a principal level, yes. All right. And in relation to for business lending, you recall we looked at the point which was for business lending, understand the drivers of the customer's cash flow, considering the impact of a customer's business and economic environment on cash flow, and then analyse historical financial data and assess projected cash flow as the primary repayment source. As I understand it, your view is what was done in this case in relation to this projected cash flow was sufficient to follow the requirements of the credit policy? I think so. I think that the challenge in answering that question is I don't have notes as to what the conversation was between the banker and the customer, but on the face of what I've seen, I, could, I think that they were uh, forming an opinion Yes. Well, and I just, obviously, as you say, you're not involved in this. You're coming to attempt to reconstruct this later, and no doubt you have to do that a lot. You have to go back and look at credit decisions that have been made at different times to try to understand what it is that has happened. The bank does. I don't personally do I this on a frequent basis, no. Well, if we just think for a moment about what seems to be a critical fact in this cash flow, which is it's based on existing store sales. And as you, you made various points yesterday about the uncertainty as to what that means, is that something that it would be expected that a banker making the judgment or forming the opinion about whether credit should be given should press down on before being satisfied that the cash flows are legitimate? I think that the, the banker needs to have established in their own mind that there has been a basis for how the revenue figures have been arrived at. I think that in the case of a cash flow like this where there's a franchise or that is saying that they've used existing store sales, albeit from a different jurisdiction as the basis, then they have some basis for forming an opinion that this is, is based in fact. Um, I personally would have preferred to see the data and the detailed assumptions, but that's my personal opinion and I, I can't say what the banker did or didn't do in this circumstance. So what you've identified is one way that you might go about testing this and what would be your preferred way, which is to get more detailed data and understand the assumptions that have gone into this document. That would be one way. That would be one way, yes. 
Another way of doing it would be to benchmark what was put forward against other available information. Um, you could if you had other available information, yes. And that was what FOS said ought to happen, ought to have happened? Um, FOS did say that we should have benchmarked against applicable ratios. The ATO uh, ratios that are provided are ratios that talk to particular expense lines as a percentage of turnover and they are presented in, in three categories or three ranges of turnover, but they don't actually provide benchmarks as to what the, the turnover figure itself could be expected to be. I understand. And your, your point is they don't tell you whether or not this amount of store sales is a realistic figure or not for what would be made by a Westpac kiosk, I'm sorry, a Westfield kiosk? No. <coughs> so the only way that you could really delve into and understand whether or not the store sales represented a realistic assessment of sales would be to unpack and understand the assumptions behind the projections? Um, that would be one way. You could do, um, you could, if you had access to other comparable businesses, um, you could look at what revenue levels they were achieving. Um, you could do the sort of back of the envelope test that the Commissioner was discussing yesterday. Um, so there are other ways of forming an opinion and with a start-up business that's what you need to do because you don't have historical operating figures to project from. I understand. I, and I don't think, I'm not trying to suggest to you that there should be some mandatory requirement. I think you've used that word a few times, mandatory requirement. What I just want to understand is you're a very experienced person within the bank and very experienced in relation to dealing with small business lending. And I want you to assist the Commissioner to understand from, from your perspective as somebody who's very careful and obviously over the detail, what is to be expected of the prudent and diligent banker in going about assessing this? And I, I think, I could be wrong, but I think what you're saying is you can't see on the face of the documents that are within ANZ's records that the banker, <coughs> so take the banker first, the banker has done the things that you would expect a prudent and diligent banker to do. I, I can't see that they have done any analysis of the underlying assumptions for the revenue, no. And similarly, when it comes to the credit officer, you can't see that the credit officer on the documents that ANZ has, has done the things that you would expect a prudent and diligent banker to do. I can't see that the credit officer has um, done any of those assumption testing either, no. But your point, I think, to be fair to you is maybe somebody didn't and they just didn't write it down. They may have. I think uh, also coming back to... Um, there were a number of people involved in this transaction and I think that the... Um, it, look, I don't know what conversations occurred and, and I'm not seeing any evidence in the file notes of what conversations may have occurred on the topic, no. Right. And <clears throat> then if we can <coughs> then for a moment step away from sales and just think about the next point that you raised, which is expenses and benchmarking. Again, presumably there are different ways that a banker could be expected to form a view as to whether the projected costs were reasonable or not? Uh, well, I would expect them to look at what costs had been included, yes, and, and form a view about it. And one way would be to do what FOS suggested, which is to use a benchmark available from the ATO? 
Yes, you could use a benchmark from the ATO to, to form a view about whether the assumption um, was in line with that benchmark, yes. And we can go to the detail if it would help you, or go to the documents if it would help you, but I suspect you know these things from memory. You know that the business plan predicted a ratio of expenses to turnover of 68%. <coughs> Actually, no, I didn't remember that number, that's sorry. Right. <laughs> uh, well, if we... <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Gibson, that's not a criticism of I'm you. Sorry. You seem to have every detail at your fingertips. Uh, could we just bring up K, uh, tab 62 of the exhibits to Ms. Gibson's documents? And this is this is the FOS recommendation. If we go to page dot one six five two, you'll see on the at the top of the page under section three point three expenses turnover under the industry benchmark, which comes from the ATO, is 84 to 93 per cent, but under the business plan it's 68 per cent? Yes. And that would be one way in which a, a very, I would think a very quick way in which a banker might look at a profit and loss and say, does this look right compared to industry benchmarks? They could certainly look at it and see whether or not the assumptions, you know, fell in the average for the industry, yes. In this case, they fall significantly out away from the average, don't they? Yes, they're outside the range. And that's right, they're outside the range and they're also outside significantly away from what the average mm. is. Yes. 200 <laughs> basis points, aren't they, from the... I haven't. I have to say, I've looked more at the cogs and the, the expense to turnover ratio. But yes. Um, and I just want to. I'm sorry. I said 200, 2,000 basis points. Twenty percent. I think it's probably easier just to say that. <laughs> um, the so the the point that we're trying to get at here is to understand your view, which is there is no need to do this. I. I'm not sure that I'm saying that there's no need to do it. I'm just saying that it, I don't believe it's a requirement that you have to um, reset the cash flows to the industry benchmark in order for that to be reasonable. I think if, if somebody presents to us with a business plan where they're outside the industry benchmarks, you should expect that you have an understanding of why they believe that they can run the business that way. Um, and I also think that in the context of, excuse me, <clears throat> um, looking at the serviceability, that's one of the reasons that we do stress testing on the, the serviceability. And the stress testing of the serviceability, though, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment, but mm -hmm. all of the stress testing of the serviceability in this case involve consideration of the income outside of the business. Do you agree? In terms of what was documented, it was looking at the holistic income, yes. I think you're agreeing with me, but I'll ask my question again. All of the stress testing that has been recorded in writing by ANZ as having been done in this case involved including the income from outside of the business? Yes. All right. And there was no stress testing done of looking just at the serviceability of the loan based just on the income of the business? Not that I've seen recorded in the file, no. All right. And if we just come back to this question of assessing costs, I, I want to make sure I've 
fairly allowed you to explain to the commissioner your view about it, which is, Foz said, this is a way you could have done it. You agree? Yes. And you're not disagreeing that that's a way you could have done it? No. You're saying there's no requirement that you do it that way? I'm saying that Foz said we could have done that and should have done that, and the fact that we didn't do it meant that the loan had been was irresponsible in their opinion. I'm saying it is a way it could be done, and I don't think that it it should be mandatory that you use that as uh, for every application that comes through the door. It, it it's a distinction. You you can do it. I'm just saying I don't think that it has to be um, done in every instance. Thank you. And. Perhaps then, again, just to be fair to you, to make sure I haven't, well, I don't say something in closing that unfairly portrays your evidence. You don't suggest, though, that there's anything that you can see in writing on the ANZ file that shows that ANZ has otherwise done something other than using benchmarks to satisfy itself or to act as the prudent and diligent banker in assessing serviceability. There is a note by the assessor in the assessment notes um, where she has, I believe, uh, thought about the total expenses of, as a percent of sales and formed a view that it seemed reasonable. Uh, that is, it's been calculated off a sales figure that was incorrectly entered. And so I think that the assessor did take a step of thinking about whether or not the expenses looked reasonable but standing back in hindsight looking at it, she was doing that from a data point that was incorrect. All right. <coughs> now then, we spoke a little bit about the methods of serviceability and I just want to go and, and deal with that now. <coughs> you know that one of the issues that FOS raised was that ANZ had relied on the director's personal income or one of the director's personal income to fund the loan if the company could not meet its obligations. Yes. And it, as I understand it, and I think as you understand it, FOS found that that was itself a breach of ANZ's obligations of due care and skill under the code of banking practice? Yes, I believe that was their finding. And this issue may get a bit confused, I think, in the way that it gets put together and some questions that I've already asked you. You have a criticism of FOS's approach in, ta in the way that it deals with guarantors' income. And could you just explain to the Commission that criticism? Um, are, you, are you referring to my statement? Yes. I want to say my statement. Um, the, the concern that I had with respect to the way that FOS, or my understanding of what FOS was saying should have been done, is that we should have, consi beyond considering what a bank would term a first way out, which is that we had to form a view that the company could afford the loan and we had a view that they could. Um, we then need to give regard to what would happen if they were in default and we were to rely on the guarantee that the directors had provided. Um, FOS's view seemed to be that because there was no tangible security that was sufficient to extinguish the liability, that um, second way out would rely on the income that was available to make the banks the payments on the bank loan and that in considering that serviceability we should have regard to that individual director being able to afford all of their personal commitments and the entirety of the business loan 
My concern, and, and that if that wasn't demonstrable, then that would be um, irresponsible and we should not have extended the loan, um, or at least not taken the guarantee. My concern with that approach is that when you are lending to a business, and particularly a small business, um, I, we have a policy at ANZ of requiring guarantees from each of the directors, and that reflects the fact that the, in most cases, the directors are also the owners and are often the managers as well. And so in order to understand the true debt servicing capacity of a business, you do need to give regard to all of the entities that have a right to those cash flows and control of those cash flows. That's why we take, that's one of the reasons, we take guarantees from directors and then we look at the capacity to service holistically for all of the directors and the borrowing entity, which in this case was the company. So, and that's, that's why we have included um, the husband's income and the consumer liabilities in that calculation. If, when we looked at the stress test, if you like, or the, um, the I think what the assessor termed the break even, she was looking at what would happen if the company um, was stressed. She, um, I suppose, collectively did that by reducing the profit generated by the business to zero and reducing the salary that the owner would take to 25000 rather than 50000 And then she combined that with the director's um, income and expenses to look at it. My understanding of what Foz is saying is that you don't have an asset, you go to the income. If you don't have an income that's sufficient to cover all of the family's expenses and the business loan, you shouldn't lend. And that would mean that somebody who wanted to start a business who didn't have a tangible security and didn't have a partner with an income sufficient to cover the business debt and all of the family expenses would not be able to get a loan. This is quite an important point. I want to try to break it down in a way that I hope will be of assistance to the Commissioner. You've referred to an idea within ANZ, which is there has to be two ways out, or at least two ways out. Yes, we talk about that in the credit principles as well. Yes. And the, f the first way out is that the company should be able to, from its income, service the loan. Yes. And we should be clear when we talk about a way out, that's effectively ANZ's way out of the loan. How is its loan going to be yes, paid out? Yes, it, it is. How do we form an opinion that the borrower can actually repay the loan? And the first way out, as we say, is the borrower, in this case the company, is going to be able to repay the loan? Yes. And the second way out is only relevant if the borrower can't repay the loan out of the borrower's, in out of the borrower's income? Yes. And the second way out in this case and in many small business loans is going to be by recourse to the income or assets of a guarantor. Yes. And typically <coughs> ANZ would require the directors of the borrower to give a guarantee. The directors, if the borrower is a company then yes. And in this case the two directors were the husband and wife? Yes. And the second way out then for ANZ would be by recourse to the assets of the husband and wife that were secured by the guarantees? The guarantees are, um, direct, the director's guarantees are well, it's up to the guarantor to decide which assets or income that they would use. But yes, it, we have recourse to the director's guarantee that they take on the obligation to, to pay the loan back. And one way of reading Foz's determination, and I think the way that you read it, also the way I read it, is that Foz was suggesting that just with respect to that second way out, ANZ 
also ought to have been satisfied that the income of one of the directors, in this case the husband, would be sufficient by itself to service the loan and yes. pay the family's expenses. Yes, that's how I read it. And that director wasn't working or wasn't going to work in the business of the borrower or not full time? He wasn't going to be drawing an income as based on the plan, no. They were, it appears as if Foz was suggesting that it would be necessary, that the relevant income for that second way out would be his income from an unrelated occupation. Yes. And the point that you're making is if that was really what was required of a bank, then that would have a very significant and detrimental effect on the ability of small businesses to get credit. I think it's difficult to say exactly how significant and detrimental it would be, but I think that if, if banks accepted that definition, then we would have to look at these, um, these applications and in the absence of um, there being you know, a, a, an income available to service the debt in the event of default, under FOS's definition, then we shouldn't lend. And I have to say, I believe that we do lend in those circumstances. <clears throat> I believe um, there are probably many small businesses um, who get funding in those circumstances who could be assumed not to be able to access that if that was the case. So I do believe it would have a negative impact. But let's just, again, to help the Commissioner see just how wide the potential negative impact effect could be. The, the situation we're dealing with is a husband and wife. Yes. And in that case, if the husband and wife are guarantors and directors of the company that's starting the business, but one of them work, is going to work in the business, then at least there's an income outside of the business. Yes. And the significant restriction that this would place on the availability of credit in that sort of circumstance is that unless one spouse had an income from a separate occupation sufficiently high to not only cover the family's living expenses, but also to cover the full borrowing of the business, then seemingly on Foz's approach, the bank would be unable to lend. That, that's my interpretation of it, yes. And how that would apply then if it wasn't a couple, if it was just an individual wanting to start a business but offering up their home as security is unclear? Well, my, my understanding is if you, know, if you had an individual who was single who had not at that point in their life accumulated sufficient assets to be able to offer security um, equal to the loan that they were requesting, clearly they wouldn't have an income outside the business if they were going to be working full time in it. And therefore, I'm, I'm not sure how you could say that you had met Foz's expectation. And so I'm not entirely clear how you would lend to a person who didn't have a spouse or assets. And I just understand what you believe Foz's expectation to be. Is it an expectation to service the debt or to repay the debt? On my reading of it, they... And look, I haven't... My reading of it was they said that there wasn't sufficient equity in the second residential mortgage and therefore we were giving regard to the income to service the debt and therefore that, that's what they were talking about, that we, they didn't believe that we had considered that director's capacity to pay for all of the family's expenses and the business debt. And service the debt? Or servicing the debt, sorry. Service, yes, not servicing repay. the debt, not repay. Yes. Well, re not, yes, not repay in full at that time, but service the debt, yes. yes. And... <coughs> Your, to summarise then, your point is that's just, if that's what FOS's determination means, 
And that's just not something that, seem, that seems to go well beyond what could be expected of the prudent and diligent banker. Um, Event, sorry, go uh, on. So in the context of small business, I suppose the, the skill and care of a prudent banker to me is what the bank as a whole is doing. And therefore the risk appetite that the bank has is part of, of that, um, my estimation. And it would imply if we as a bank say that we have got ap risk appetite to support small business owners in that situation and FOS is saying that that's contrary to the code, then I, I think that's problematic, yes. Now, having made these criticisms of what is perhaps the interpretation of FOS and the uncommercial interpretation of FOS, there was a circumstance that led into that wasn't there in this case, which was that on the documents, the only serviceability assessments that ANZ had done included the personal income of the husband. As one of the directors, yes. And so it's, it's possible that this is really, we should be clear about this so that it's not meant as a general criticism of FOS's approach, it's possible that this is just a particular case linked to the particular way in which ANZ went about assessing serviceability in this case. I'm sorry, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question. Well, you haven't seen other cases where FOS has said for the second way out, for the security offered for a loan, it's necessary that there be a second income outside of the business capable of servicing the loan. I haven't, but I did read the determination and in the determination they say that they are making that determination with reference to other cases. And so my, um, my I suppose, assumption is that they are making this determination with, with reference to how they think about this generally. All right. And can I... I because I think this is quite helpful for the Commissioner. Is there any other, apart from the two types of circumstances we've talked about, which is a couple and the difficulties that would be created if a couple were trying to borrow and an individual and the difficulties that would be created if an individual was trying to borrow because the individual doesn't have any other income. Are there any other observations you want to make about the problems that would be that would arise if it was necessary to factor in the ability of a guarantor on the guarantor's own income to service the loan. I think, uh, with regards to the income, no, that was the main concern that I had. Now, when we're dealing with guarantors, can I ask about ANZ's approach? to parental guarantees, are you familiar with that? Uh, to the extent that it is discussed in, in the Small Business Credit Guidelines, I am. Okay. And is there a distinction, do you think, between a parent guaranteeing a child's borrowings, business borrowings, as compared with <laughs> a husband and wife or two partners where one of the where one of the spouses is effectively the controller of the borrowing? I think that there are differences. I think that our concern with respect to guarantees is to understand um, whether someone who is providing a guarantee is actually getting a financial benefit from the loan and that would put them in a, in a different um, category, I think, in our minds. I think we're from, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going from memory here and I, I probably should go to the, the policy, but I, I'm pretty sure that we are clear that if, if it's obviously obvious that the um, guarantor is not involved in the business, that we should be ensuring that that is um, understood by the guarantor and that they should be getting legal advice. Sorry, if the guarantor isn't receiving any benefit, did you say? 
if if the guarantor is not involved in the business and can't be seen to be getting benefit from the business, then it's our expectation that that puts them into a higher risk category and that the banker um, would need to ensure that they had um, advised them that they should be getting independent legal advice. Yes, so if, for example, a parent wasn't a director or a shareholder of a company controlled by a child that was making a borrowing, but the parent offered a guarantee, that wouldn't necessarily mean the guarantee couldn't be accepted. It would just mean that extra care needed to be taken with respect to the guarantee. Yes, I don't think that we would seek to exclude the ability of parents to guarantee their children's loans. And business loans in particular? Business loans, yes. Right. Now, I want to then look at the serviceability assessment. Just so that before we leave the question of parental guarantees, there may be a number of uh, considerations at play here, and I just wanted to understand them better than I do. Would you accept that there are cases where a parent's decision to guarantee uh, a loan made to a child is dictated by uh, considerations other than commercial considerations? Yes, I would. The parent is concerned to, uh, or the parent provides the guarantee as a sign of uh, support for or endorsement of the child's ambition. Yes, I think that's reasonable. And that, uh, at least in some closely held proprietary companies, being a guarantor, uh, being a guarantor, being a director uh, or a shareholder may not tell you uh, much about whether that person has any uh, realistic prospect of standing to benefit commercially from the transactions the company makes. I think it is, it, you have to look at each case on a case-by-case -case basis. I went back to reread this morning uh, uh, the Garcia's case, 1997-98. Mrs Garcia was a director and a shareholder of, what was it called, Citizens Gold or something. So I think being a director and a shareholder uh, may not be conclusive of it. But there we are. I'm just revisiting my past, Miss Gibson. Don't <laughs> worry about that. <laughs> I, but I, I think, Commissioner, the, the point that you're making, and I haven't read the case in question, but the, the point you're making that somebody can be a shareholder or a director on paper in a family business and not necessarily be heavily involved in the business is a fair point. And you need to understand who is going to be involved in the business and what understanding anyone who is um, signing up to a loan has of what they're signing up to. And that's, and I think to be fair to you, we bring up ANZ's credit, small business credit requirements, which is Exhibit 7 or Tab 7 to your documents, ANZ.800.497.5048. And go to the page ending dot 5135. And there's this section dealing with guarantors requiring independent advice. And the ANZ policy is a guarantor will require independent advice if he or she is an individual in a special relationship of dependence with the borrower. 
and then you'll see a little down the page some of the circumstances that may indicate that the guarantor does require independent advice include, and then the second bullet point, relatives including parents guaranteeing business facilities where they have no financial interest in the business. And that's the point you're making, that in that circumstance, what ANZ would expect to happen is that they get independent legal advice? Yes. And then the question becomes, what does that actually mean? What is, how much advice is required? And do you have a view about that? Uh, my personal view is that they should um, take the information to a lawyer and have the lawyer advise them on what the legal implications are of signing up. And do you think it would be a problem for ANZ to provide to the guarantor and also to therefore the lawyer providing advice, detailed information about ANZ's credit assessment of the borrower? Um, it depends what you mean by detailed. I, we are um, quite prescriptive about the information that needs to be made available to a guarantor. Um, I think it is set out in one of my exhibits. I just can't recall at the moment where for example we'll just see if we can turn this up but ANZ makes a calculation of the serviceability of the loan and it does that in order to assess the risk to it that its first way out is available um, I think you might be referring to the uncommitted monthly income amount that um, we need to see that that's a positive number in order to see that it can be serviced, the loan can be serviced. I don't believe that we make that number available to guarantors, no. Would it be a problem, do you think, for ANZ to make that information available to guarantors? I think that that number <coughs> might end up creating a lot of questions in the mind of the customers that would be complicated to explain. And the reason I say that is that when we calculate the, the UMI, the uncommitted monthly income, we sensitise all of the consumer liabilities by using higher interest rates that mean that a lot of the payments that someone will have declared to us on their application are going to look higher in the, um, the calculation we do. And so, I mean, we, we could provide it, but I suspect it would end up in some... Um, reasonably heated conversations with customers about why we were counting expenses higher than they were. I think the thing that is important for the guarantor to understand is what is the information that's been provided to us on which we've made our decision, um, whether there is um, information about the credit history of the borrower that they may or may not be privy to, and I, I believe that is one of the things that is provided if they've been defaulting, for instance, then that's disclosed to the guarantor. Um, but I think the UMI is, is an internal calculation rather than it is a number that we would um, seek to explain to a guarantor. And but is the guarantor in a position where without the borrowers uh, uh, cooperation, the guarantor or the guarantor's advisors could determine uh, serviceability coverage, repayment coverage, uh, issues of the, that kind? Uh, when you say without the borrower's cooperation, are you referring to if, if, if the borrower is not sharing with their parent what the details are? Is, is it? Um, no, I think it's unlikely that a, a legal advisor could, could do that. I think that the legal advisor would assume that that had been done by the bank or the loan wouldn't be extended in the first place. Did you have any more questions no. about that topic, Commissioner? Thank you. I want to return to the business plan document that we were looking at. 
which is exhibit 30. And I want to look at this document again and now look at it in the context of the, the second question that or issue that I foreshadowed at the beginning, which is about drawing or connected with drawing the line between personal responsibility and the responsibility of the bank. If we go to the page dot zero zero one zero that we looked at yesterday. Yes. Again, you'll recall this says that this is a successful New Zealand franchise. Were you able on your perusal of the document to find anything that indicated how many New Zealand franchises there were? In the business plan? No, I wasn't. All right. Or in what areas of New Zealand they were located? No, I wasn't. <laughs> or what proportion of stores fell into their, what they describe as their four different types on page ending dot zero zero one two, retail store, kiosk store, production pod, and event pod? No, I wasn't. And we looked at a few slightly comical parts of this business plan yesterday. You've obviously seen many, or I assume you've seen many more business plans than I have. Does this seem consistent with the type of business plan that you would expect a borrower to put in when starting up a business? I think I would say that the business plans are many and varied and there are very different levels of detail in them. I suppose, what I'd suggest is looking at this document and we can perhaps most easily just turn through the pages to see what it's like. If we go to page, the next page, and 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 the next page. It, it appears like, well, in fact, actually, I'm not even sure that's gelato in that. <laughs> if you have a look at I think it that's It does appear to be an ice cream, yes. Uh, but it, it appears as if this is a document present. Now, it's, we discussed yesterday the issue of has it come from the franchisor or the franchisee? And it appears to have come from the franchisor. You agree? It, it looks to me like a template document that the franchisor would use with franchisees and would populate with um, data specific to the franchisee, but then would reuse you know, for future business plans. And can I suggest substantially filled with what looks like clip art? Do you agree? Yes. And I think to use terminology that you and I were using yesterday, using a lot of very general marketing language to explain what exactly the business is and how it's going to operate. Uh, yes, I think it could have been more succinct, yes. And it looks like a marketing pitch rather than a business plan, do you agree? I think business plans serve multiple purposes and one of them is a marketing document. So it's not surprising that there is an element of that in it. Do you think that it's... It's obviously a document that when you looked at, you thought perhaps lacked the type of directed detail that you would like in a business plan? I suppose I have to say I have looked at a lot of business plans but I have, have done so outside of small business as well and I'm not sure that I'm necessarily the... the I'm going to look for a lot more detail. I think that that's my nature than perhaps everyone else is going to. And I wonder then, and we move into this issue of 
personal responsibility. Do you think that there's any need or obligation on the banker to raise or query with the borrower whether they really understand what they're getting into and what the success or otherwise is of the franchise or? I do think that the banker should be asking questions about whether or not the person who's going into the business you know, has, um, has thought about it and has, has understood what they're getting into. Um, I do recall seeing notes um, in between the assessor and the banker uh, where he says that he has spoken with the applicants and that they do understand what they're getting into. I'm obviously not privy to what exactly those conversations were about. I think that um, in a situation where applicants are saying that they are going to put you know, a very significant amount of their own money into a business, it's not unreasonable for a banker to expect that they have thought hard about that investment. And take some level of personal responsibility for that rather than expecting somebody else who's not their financial advisor to note problems for them. Yes. In your review of the documents, do you think that one of the problems in this case may have been the drive for sales by various people involved in the transaction? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not entirely sure where you're going. Well, let me break it down. If we go to the beginning of exhibit number 30, uh, to ANZ.800.534.0041. Mm -hmm. The email? Yeah. Yes, so this is the chain of emails between the banker and the broker. And you'll recall the broker writing to the banker saying, mate, my neck is online here. I've lost a couple of deals from the franchisor as well. Please let me know. I already explained they consultant ANZ manager and knew this is a deal. It, unsurprisingly, the broker is obviously pushing to get this loan made and get this potential franchisee into the franchise? Well, the broker will have met with the customer. The broker has obviously formed an opinion that he believes that the loan should be approved. Um, and the broker's business model is that they are paid commissions on the loans that are done. So yes, he has, you know, if he thinks that the loan should be done, he has an incentive for it to be done. And then, when we move then to the what happens then between the credit manager and the broker, I'm sorry, the credit manager and the banker, you referred to some file notes. Perhaps if we just bring up one of those, which is KGG-34. And if we go to the page ending in dot 0145. Sorry, actually, it should be dot 0144. So this is a section of the, the document by which the loan is built up setting out the nature of the business? Um, yeah, in, in the loans, um, the system that was used by the bankers at the time, um, they needed to put uh, notes in about the application uh, for the credit officer to refer to. And so what the banker says to the credit officer 
is just to note a few things. You'll see see that this particular franchise is a big franchise with over 100 franchise sites in New Zealand and have just started to sell franchises in Australia. This franchise model has been a proven one all over the world with headquarters in New Zealand. Yes. And I take it you don't know where that statement came from? I don't know, no. And the banker hasn't recorded <laughs> hasn't kept any notes or any documents explaining where that statement came from? He hasn't got any notes about the conversations he had, no. And then over the page on dot zero one four five, the banker says CTS evident with projection CTS's capacity to service. Is that right? Yes and projections prepared given by franchisor based on performance of similar sites in their franchise model based on demographics traffic? Yes. And that statement appears to go well beyond what's contained in the business plan? Um, it, well, it goes beyond in as much as it talks about the demographics and traffic. And it, also that it's done based on the performances of similar sites in the franchise model. I think when we were looking at that exhibit, it said that it was based on similar, similar store sales. So in that sense, I, I assume that's the extension of what's in the business plan. I see. But in so far, at least then, in so far as it refers to demographics traffic, again, the, bro the banker hasn't recorded any document or any note explaining what the source of that information is? No, he hasn't. All right. And then... If we go then to the document, which is Exhibit 30, ANZ.800.470.0103. And these are the internal notes being made I think by the credit assessment, credit assessment officer, is that right? Um, I believe what this is, is that um, the notes that are in the SB loans system um, have been extracted into, because they're not actually able to be read when you look at the screenshot, so they've been extracted into a document to make it easier to read. But if you've got the unredacted version, you can see who's making the notes. You can't see it on this because it's marked as um, confidential. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to work out which page that is in the... I You've thought got we were in exhibit tab 35. Oh, 35. Sorry, I was in the wrong tab. Yes, sorry. And you can see the blue highlighted name in your version. That's the credit assessment officer. Yes. And if we go over to the end page, dot zero one zero four. The, you'll see the last note, clients purchasing franchise, which is a big franchise with over 100 franchise sites in New Zealand, and just started to sell franchises in Australia. This is the credit officer picking up the information that's been provided to him by the banker. Yes. And if we go back to the first page, dot zero one zero three, when he's explaining <coughs> his approach to the cash flow forecast. He notes this turnover and the net profit after management wages, and then says cash flow forecast cannot be tested in this instance. Do you understand what that means? My understanding of what they mean there is that because this is a startup business, they can't be tested against historical financials. I see. But it could be tested in other, or could be either explored or tested in other ways that we've already talked about today. Yes. And then the, the finding is believe break even is achievable based on stress test completed with capacity to service clearly evident based on the husband's continuing PAYG income. And then yes. Slightly more. 
expanded version of that. You see the final note is refer comprehensive business plan. Yes. Would you expect the credit officer to be slightly more skeptical of the business plan we've seen in this type of case? As I said before, um, the reality of business plans that present in the small business space is that they are um, very varied in their content and level of detail. And I think that notwithstanding you know, the, the concerns that you and I have discussed, I think that the bulk of the detail one expects in a business plan is there. And then if we go to tab 40, well, I'm sorry, tab, yes, tab 40. No, 41. ANZ.800.539.0217 and go to page.0263. <coughs> and this is the capacity to service form that is setting out the different ways in which capacity to service was considered by ANZ in this case? Yes. And there's, as I understand it, no consideration done to just the projected income of the business? Um, it hasn't been recorded. I think, as it said in the notes earlier, the, based on the cash flow forecast projection, serviceability was clearly evident. And so I, I think they just haven't um, they haven't gone and recorded that. They've moved straight on to the planning for default scenario and looking at that. Well, the, the planning for default scenario, which I think is called the break-even scenario, is just halving the income from the business and removing for the wife and removing any of the net profit from the business and then just using the husband's income. That's, that's the break-even column, yes. And one of the problems then with that break-even column is, as you've already noted, it, it actually leaves out some liabilities. Yes, it does. And so then you get over the page to dot zero two six four, and the on that break-even scenario, the uncommitted monthly income is only $586, and that's with some liabilities left out. Yes. And do you accept that insofar as ANZ decided to assess the serviceability of the loan on this break-even scenario and only on the break-even scenario without testing the cash flows, that the consequence is that it failed in this case to exercise the um, care and diligence or the diligence and prudence of a prudent banker? I don't think that this... I don't have a problem with using a break-even like this as a way of stressing the cash flows. Um, I, I do have a problem that there were liabilities left out of that calculation, but no, I, th I think that this is um, something that the assessors would do. It serves as a way of, I suppose, stressing a number of assumptions at once, particularly if you don't have an actual model to stress them individually. Well, if we just confine it then to the fact that, as you say, some liabilities have been left out, that means that on this break-even scenario, <coughs> the consequence is that if you put the liabilities back in, they wouldn't have been able to service the loan. If you put um, both of the liabilities in, then it would have been a negative UMI. However, it's a scenario. And so um, having, I, I have looked at this, I've brought it up and, and seen what happens when you do put the liabilities in. Um, certainly the lease payment, which was 485 a month, doesn't take it to negative. The personal overdraft of 7,000 would. However, the assessor may have, if that had occurred, varied the scenario and if you increased the salary taken by the owner to 30,000 then you're back into positive territory and so it's not it, it's hard to say what would have happened had that been um, 
been the outcome and they'd been in there. The assessor may have exercised their judgment to vary that scenario. And that, that involves this problem though, doesn't it? That what's happening in all of those scenarios is that rather than just focusing on and testing the information that you have about the borrower's income, you're effectively treating the borrower's income as something very flexible and then just adding it to the income of the spouse who's not working in the business? Well, in, in the case of a company, the income is very flexible. So yes, we are. But you're doing that in circumstances where you've already concluded we can't actually test or we haven't tried to test the income or projected <coughs> income of the company. Yes, we are. Um, and look, I did grapple with this and um, looked at, um, you know, what if you were to vary some of those assumptions, you know, what would that look like? But I, that's not the way that the assessor has gone about it, no. And now I want to just ask you a few questions about incentives in this case. Can we go to exhibit 23 of your statement. Which is ANZ.800.528.0001. Mm -hmm. This is the incentive scheme that applied at the relevant time. Um, no, this was the incentive scheme for the first half of 2014, which goes from October 13 to um, March 14. Um, there were two incentive... The period when the loan started would have been what we called second half 14, and the period when it settled was the first half of 15. All right. And... Those are both in there, if you would... Well, perhaps if we, I think we can do this just by reference to this document okay. to begin with. If we go to dot zero zero two five, so this is, I'm sorry, dot zero zero two four. It should begin with. Mm -hmm. I just want to work through the four key measures that ANZ was using at the time. The first was financial. Yes. And obviously enough, that's, that's financial, that's concerned with sum of lending and cross-selling. Um, the specific measures for each of the, the roles was a bit different, but it's, it's about the sales and revenue, yes. And then for customer, there are performance objectives and they also appear to be concerned with ultimately financial measures, total drawn lending funds under management and new to business drawn lending funds under management. Yes, they are. And then if we go over the page to dot zero zero two five, <coughs> the process part is meeting five out of six product targets. Does that, could you just explain to the commissioner what that means? Um, that is a, it's a sales target. That is with respect to um, six of the products that the small business bankers were able to either sell to customers or refer to other parts of ANZ. And that refers to them, they had targets against each of those. And if they were meeting target in five of the six categories, then that was considered meeting. And then the last category is people, which is collaboration and contribution to a high performance culture. Where would, and that doesn't seem to necessarily involve a financial target? That, um, that category would be assessed by the line manager or the state head. Um, and that would be factored into the calibration session that was held at the end of the half. Right. And I'm not sure you've quite answered my question though. Would that mean they would take into account financial matters, the line manager? Not for the people objective, no. Okay. And 
would that include compliance then? Um, I believe that that was the objective against which the not receiving any behavioural compliance flag was, was rated at that time. Under people, is that right? Yes. All right. And then if we go to dot zero zero four zero. So these are the see the hurdles to enter the scheme are set out on the bottom of the page. Yes. One of them is financial. Yes. And one of them is risk compliance and behaviours and that's strictly no risk or behaviour flags triggered is one of the criteria? Yes. And how would one trigger a risk or behaviour flag? Um, there were a number of ways that that could happen. Um, there were at the time a list of behaviours that could result in what was known as a negative alert. And if a banker was to receive three of those in the half, they would get a behaviour flag, which would mean that they were not eligible to receive an incentive. Um, if a banker had, um, you know, there was some aspect of their behaviour that the line manager or the bank took issue with, they could issue a behaviour flag. And again, that would take them out of um, eligibility for an incentive. And do you know may not, this may be outside of what you need to deal with, but do you know how frequently somebody in the position of the banker we're dealing with in this case study would end up with a risk or behaviour flag against them at the time? I'm sorry, I don't know that. No, I understand. All right. What I want to do then is look at some other documents, which are the performance reviews for this banker at the time. <coughs> Can we bring up ANZ.800.602.0001? I think you've got a hard copy of that document as well, do you? Um, I do. I'm just trying to find it. It's quite small. It might be easier to look at the screen for this right. one. So this is the first half of 2014 performance review for the relevant banker? Yes. And as I understood what you said before, the, the borrowing that we are concerned with wouldn't have fallen within the first half of 2014? No, it wouldn't have. It would have fallen in the second half of 2014? Actually, no, it would have fallen in the first half of 15. Oh, I see. Um, and what's, at the time then, this banker was described as, that is in the first half of 2014, of having a great half in the first half of 2014 and meeting the majority of his targets, but he did not meet new to bank lending and was one home loan from target? Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. What are we up to? Exhibit 3.18, uh, Performance Management Plan and Review, first half 2014, ANZ 800-602-0001. Now, before we go to the next performance review, can we bring up Exhibit 24 of Ms Gibson's statement, which is ANZ.800.528.0345? And can we go to dot zero three four six? And this this is setting out the key messages for small business banking for the second half of two thousand and fourteen. Yes. And the 
first key message is to achieve our aspiration in becoming the leading corporate and commercial bank in Australia, we need to constantly review and change the way we relentlessly acquire new to bank business. I mean, I'm sorry, new to bank customers. Yes. And then it's explained a little further down, given the importance of new to bank acquisition, we've increased new to bank lending targets for business banking managers while leaving the overall lending target unchanged. Yes. And can we then bring up ANZ.800.602.0007, <coughs> and this is the Banker's Performance Review for the second half of 2014. Yes. And what's said is that the banker, the banker's half has been fantastic, outperforming across most measures. He is a role model for the team and in addition to his numbers, has spent a lot of time training branch staff and the new SBS above and beyond was expected. He's been promoted to a business banking manager and thoroughly deserves it. Yes. And he says, has been a great half given the challenge I put myself to achieving new to bank lending. Yes. And I'm sorry, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.19 Performance Management Plan and Review, second half 2014, ANZ 800602006. And do you accept that the relentless focus on new to bank lending may have contributed to poor practices at ANZ in relation to bringing in new loans? No, I don't. I think bankers were very clear that they needed to meet the compliance and requirements. It certainly would have meant they focused on building their circle of influence and finding opportunities to bring customers to ANZ, but I, I don't accept that it follows that it led to poor practice. Can we bring up ANZ.800.558.0008? Now, it appears that by 2015, things had come a little unstuck for this banker. Do you agree? I think you've brought up an exhibit of a disciplinary matter that occurred for the bankers. And can we go to the page dot zero zero one four? So this was a warning given in 2017 by ANZ to the banker, but it concerned conduct through 2015? It concerned two loans that had been made in 2015, yes. And the banker had provided a response as part of the investigation to ANZ? Yes. And if we go to page dot zero zero one six. The particular point I want to draw your attention to is point number three, which is that the banker's response, or one of the banker's responses was that in the ex excitement of closing new deals, a culture of sales pressure that you felt weighed heavily at the time, and your relative inexperience and newness to the role at the time all contributed to these oversights and the lack of due diligence you showed? Yes. Do you except that at the time there was a culture of sales pressure that the banker was under? I have thought a lot about that phrase. I think that it is, it is the case that the culture in small business was one of wanting to perform. Um, <coughs> I'm, I don't accept the characterisation of being under sales pressure but I accept that that's what the banker has said that they felt they were under. And having regard to the performance reviews that we looked at and the performance targets, the targets were 
take the targets first. The targets were primarily concerned with financial matters. At that time, yes. And the comments that were made in the performance review were primarily concerned with financial matters? Yes. And you made the point at that time, in your view, has there been a change in approach by ANZ over the last three or four years? With respect to the... Um, financial targets and... There has been, pressure. yes. There, um, as you identified, there were sales targets that were um, uh, against customer and process, and that was something that... Um, I personally didn't feel made a lot of sense. Um, those incentives have evolved. Uh, it wasn't overnight, but it has been an evolution that um, started with the first half 15 incentive plan and has reached a point now where the financial measures are up to 30% of a banker's measures and that the measures that are against customer and process and people um, I think are more appropriately aimed at, at what we're trying to achieve in those objectives. Commissioner, I have no further questions for Ms Gibson. Yes, thank you. Ms Gibson, can I go back to uh, guarantees? Yes. Uh, you've been asked a number of questions about uh, bankers uh, or the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker and you know that that's an expression that ultimately finds its source uh, for present purposes in the Banking Code of Conduct. Is that right? Yes, I do. And um, do you understand that uh, under the code as it presently exists, uh, leave aside the future code, uh, the notion of care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker is a notion that uh, can apply to a prospective guarantor? Yes, I do. Yeah. And what I want you to think about is how does that duty, or what does that duty say, if anything, uh, to a case where the prospective guarantor has the characteristics of parent, no income except social security payment, and is about to pledge the only asset they have, which is their residence. Does the notion of care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker say anything to that set of circumstances? Mm. I'm sorry, Commissioner, because that's not the circumstance of I, mean, I probably haven't given huge thought to that prior to being here today, so if I can just take a moment. Yes. Um, I recognise the question's not easy, but I'd be assisted by your, your understanding. In, in the circumstance that you're saying, I am presuming you mean where that guarantee is being offered with respect to a business yeah. loan, yes. The child's business um, venture, the parent is offering to go guarantor, but you, the circumstances I'm positing yeah. are parent, no income except social security, guarantee to be supported by mortgage, mortgage over the only asset uh, the parent has, which is the residence. I think that in that scenario, there is clearly a risk that the business could fail. And in the scenario you've, um, and, and that's because there is a risk that any business might fail. Um, in that scenario you've described, it would seem inevitable that the bank that had taken such a guarantee would seek to um, have recourse to the home and that would clearly cause 
hardship to the individual um, who, whose home it was and therefore you would need to be, um, yeah. I suppose personally I'm uncomfortable with, with that sort of scenario but I understand that parents, and I am a parent, might you know, want to provide that support to their children um, and shouldn't be prohibited from doing so, but you would you would want to be comfortable as a banker that they absolutely understood what they were doing. I think it, it may be that uh, there was a time, maybe it still is the time, I don't know. It's something I'm going to have to hear about. But there would have been a time where intersection between parental feelings of duty and support and uh, affection and sentiment and the commercial assessment of the transaction would have been seen as matters wholly for the guarantor and only for the guarantor. And the guarantor makes his, her own choice. That's why I, I, I yeah. ask you the question about whether or to what extent uh, this notion of uh, care and skill of d diligent and prudent banker is speaking at all mm -hmm. uh, to the hard case I've put to you. And if it is speaking at all, what's it saying? Commissioner, I think it is... It's an extremely difficult question because if the bank decides that it should be in the business of telling parents whether or not they can support their children, I'm uncomfortable with that as a position, um, both as a parent and as a banker. Um, I think that... I, I think that the, the phrase that is in the Code of Banking Practice as it, well, as it stood... Before. I, I believe the ABA may have published a new one this week, but I, I haven't read that one. Um, the, the code that I, I have um, had in place through this period, it is necessarily a subjective um, phrase. I think the bank does need to exercise um, prudence in determining to lend in the first place. I think that the bank is or a, any bank, is warranted in um, understanding whether there is security that can be provided because banks are going to have a limited appetite for lending without security, um, which is done in the commercial sense, but you, you wouldn't want that to be the whole book. And um, if someone is saying that they are willing to go at, offer security... Um, then in some ways that is a matter for the guarantor. Um, but as you've highlighted, that those... Um, the, the parents may not have full understanding of what they're doing and I, I think you should be, um, you know, at least checking that they have understood what they're doing before they were ent enter into that arrangement. Thank you very much. Mr Hodge. Commissioner, I don't have any questions about that. I did just want to ask Ms Gibson about one other matter, which I've just... Yes. Thank you. And perhaps if we just do this by reference to Exhibit 35, which is ANZ.800.470.0103. These are the notes that you looked at earlier. And if we go to page.0104... And you see it sets out at the top of the page, or well, I should read the sentence beginning on the previous page, a formal letter of offer will be issued on satisfaction of the following conditions precedent, and then it sets out what the conditions precedent are. Yes. And the first condition precedent is provision of signed copy contract of sale confirming franchise purchase and the price. Yes. And I take it from your perspective that seems entirely conventional. Yes. You wouldn't... Would you be surprised if the loan had been approved without getting confirmation of the purchase price of the business? 
I would expect that if we're going to lend money on the assumption that they are um, buying a business for a certain amount, we would want to see the contract of sale or the, in this case, I believe it was the franchise agreement that set those details out. And if this had been approved without having required provision of the contract of sale confirming the purchase price, would you regard that as a failure to exercise the care and skill of a prudent and diligent banker? The assessor should have had some basis for understanding what was the, subs what was the substance behind the amount that was being lent. Thank you. That's all I wanted to ask. Uh, Mr Hodge, did we put in evidence that bundle of disciplinary process documents? I'm sorry, I'm not sure we did, Commissioner. I tend to that document. And is it sufficiently described as the bundle of disciplinary process documents 2017? Yes. ANZ 800 558 will become Exhibit 3.20. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Dr Collins. Ms Gibson, could I just ask some questions arising out of the exchange you had with the Commissioner about guarantees <coughs> being made to family members? And could I ask you to have a look at tab 13 in your folder and if the operator could display ANZ.800.515.0458. Ms Gibson, do you recognise those as being the current small business credit requirements for the ANZ Bank um, dated the 17th of April this year? Yes. I'm sorry, have you found it? Yes, I have. And do you recognise that as being the current small business credit requirements for the ANZ Bank? Yes. Could I ask the operator to go please to page 0551, um, Ms. Gibson, that's page 94 of those documents. Now, I just want to direct your attention to the section headed unacceptable guarantors. Um, and I just want to ask you a couple of questions about the intersection between um, those bullet points and the matters the Commissioner was asking you about. Um, so you'll see the requirement is that guarantees are not to be accepted from persons in certain circumstances. Uh, the first bullet point is about intellectual disabilities. Uh, the second, uh, a power of attorney. Uh, third, where there's reason to suspect that the guarantor is incapacitated, e.g. under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Um, fourthly, reason to suspect the guarantor did not understand the effect of the guarantee. But it's the, the next two I wanted to ask you about. Um, so unacceptable guarantors in this document include where it is suspected that the proposed guarantor is under duress from the customer um, or another guarantor or is under the influence of the customer or another guarantor. Um, is that a matter which would be of relevance in assessing whether a guarantor uh, being a parent of a customer ought be accepted? It would be relevant, yes. And the it next... It would be relevant to enforceability, I would have thought, Dr Collins. To, to, well, to, to both, uh, yeah. Your Honour, yes. Uh, Commissioner, yes. Or of undue influence still exists. <laughs> yeah. Um, th th these, th this part of the requirements, though, is addressed to whether the bank will accept a guarantor in the first place. Uh, what about the next bullet point um, from individuals who are independent to the customer group? What do you understand by that expression? Um, the phrase customer group I take to be the way we describe, um, particularly with reference to small business, um, the fact that many... Uh, many small business customers have multiple entities that are interrelated and so for us the customer group is looking at the borrowing entity which might be a company, the directors of that company, if um, the, it might be a trust, who are the trust beneficiaries etc. Um, you would want to look at the entire what's called a family tree structure for the customer group. So someone who is independent of that customer group I would take to be someone who was not a director or a shareholder or a beneficiary of the customer group. And so parents of directors of a corporate customer would be independent for the purpose of that bullet point as you would understand? Yes. Thank you. Um, 
You were asked some questions by our learned friend, Mr Hodge, about whether in the context of the gelato uh, franchise application, ANZ had exercised uh, the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker. And you were asked the questions by reference to isolated features of the application. Uh, one example, just by way of example, was um, obtaining assumptions underlying cash flow forecasts. Um, do you regard um, looking at isolated features of an application as being the way to assess whether the bank has, in the context of a particular application, complied with the standard of the diligent and prudent banker? Uh, I, I, would con I, I think you have to look at the overall um, opinion. I mean, the banker is required to form an opinion and you would have to look at all of the data points to form that view, I believe. Okay. Um, now, um, you have reviewed the application um, uh, that was examined in the course of this case study, including by reviewing the business plan that was supplied uh, to ANZ. Yes, I have. Um, Mr Hodge suggested that there were features of the business plan that might be regarded as comical. Did, did, did you regard the business plan as being comical? No. Um, and are you able to identify the Commissioner, the features of the business plan that you consider supported the application that was made in this instance? Uh, I considered, I gave consideration to the fact that they had looked at the industry and the expectations for what would happen for ice cream retailing. And just pausing there, what what feature of the business plan um, supported the application in, the, in, in relation to industry prospects? Um, there are, there's a page um, where they talk about the, um, look, I probably will have to go to it, but it, it's the market um, prospects. I can't remember the exact wording. They have reference to an IBIS World um, industry report and talk about the growth prospects for ice cream retailing. They talk about... Up for you. Sorry, Ms Gibson, Sorry. perhaps I'll just bring it up for you. It's tab 30 in your folder, ANZ.800.534.0008. And if the operator could go to pages um, 0 0.0023 and 0 0024. Um, is that the section to which you're referring, Ms Gibson? Yes, it is. Um, and could you just identify what feature of that, in your um, view, supports the application in this case? Uh, the f they've looked at what is the expectations for ice cream retailing with regard to the um, IBIS World Industry Report. And they've also looked at um, the shopping centre in question, where it's situated, the population. Um, they've, they've looked at um, you know, spend. It, this is, when I look at this, this says we are looking to open a store in a busy, successful shopping centre which would be expected to have foot traffic and have um, people who have money to buy ice creams. One of the criticisms that um, uh, Mr Hodge um, attributed to this business plan was its generic nature. What do you say about the generic nature of this business plan having regard to the data that we see on the screen? Um, I think that this data is specific to the particular location that they were planning to open their store in. Thank you. Um, with, with your, I could ask you, I could ask the operator to go to page 0033 in that document. Do you see, Ms Gibson, that this is a page headed Assumptions, uh, and um, I wanted to ask you about the assumptions generally, but in particular the assumptions about hours that would need to be worked. Um, ag again, I'll wait for you to find it. Sorry, I'm just going to get the paper one up. It's just a bit easier than... Yes. Um, can you tell the Commissioner what the relevance of this page is for the purpose of um, uh, the, the banker's um, obligation to assess the application? I think um, that notwithstanding the conversation we had about the lack of specific assumptions underpinning the revenue line, 
um, it does call out a number of the assumptions that have been used in putting together the detailed cash flow forecast. Yes, what about the, uh, uh, the assumption as to hours that would be worked? Oh, um, well, they've included a roster that showed they were going to have to work in the business. The owner or owners were going to have to work in the business. They were going to employ um, at least two people, one on a full-time basis and one as a casual. Um, and they showed um, a roster that provided coverage for the hours that they would have to be open. And could I ask the operator to go to page 0040? So this page uh, perhaps has a bit of clip art, Ms Gibson, but at the top it's got a SWOT analysis. What's a SWOT analysis? A SWOT analysis is a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis. Yes, and what, what can you say to the Commissioner about the relevance of that analysis for the, um, uh, the review that was undertaken by the banker? At, at a high level, it reflects the fact that they've um, looked at... They've had consideration to why they think that this is, um, what are the strengths of the business and the weaknesses. And I mean, it, it, it shows they've given some regard to things that have go wrong. Um, it, it calls out, uh, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, they, they would want to know that the, they had considered some of the potential threats. Um, Ms Gibson, having considered the whole of the application in this case, have you formed a view about whether um, ANZ breached the standard expected of a diligent and prudent banker? With regards to the whole of the application? Yes, um, yes I have. What view have you reached? I actually don't think that we did in this case. I am uncomfortable as I went through this file in its entirety. Um, there are a number of errors. There are data entry errors. Some of those data entry errors then caused other people to make decision without regard to data that they should have had. And I don't think that that level of error is acceptable. Yes, but in relation to whether overall the standard was breached, uh, the, the conclusion you reached was to the contrary. I'm sorry? So I thought you said to the Commissioner that the conclusion you reached was to the contrary. I said that I thought that the business plan, the consideration of the business plan was that it was acceptable. I wasn't, what I was referring to was more having taken the business plan for what it was. I've then looked at the overall application and said, um, errors are going to be made. That's just life, there are human beings involved, errors would be made. But when I stepped back and looked at the cumulative number of errors here, I was not comfortable. Um, you said in answer to a question from Mr Hodge that you had undertaken some analysis of your own, um, apart, that is apart from the break-even analysis that was conducted by the banker. What analysis did you undertake? Um, I... Uh, was interested to understand what would have been the impact of using a COGS figure of 30%. Um, so I just I made a spreadsheet of my own using the figures in the cash flow um, that were provided and then varied that assumption to see what the impact would have been. Um, and so I, I can say that if they had used a COGS figure of 30%, then the business would still have been profitable the, the COGS figure is the cost of uh, goods. The cost of goods sold. That so was the figure that I've they... I've been listening, Dr Collins. <laughs> I have been listening. <laughs> yeah. Let's get on. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and, that, and the 30 per cent, though, was derived from um, the range in the ATO benchmark document to which you would take. Yes. Yeah. Um, and did you make any other um, uh, adjustments in conducting your analysis? I did. I found there were some other errors in the cash flow when I went about the process of creating it. Um, for instance, the, the cash flow assumes um, whole of month figures in the month of November, but the business plan said they were going to open the business on the 20th of November. So I adjusted the revenue and the relevant expenses to reflect that. Um, and then I also wanted to give regard to 
what was the um, impact of the break-even analysis. And so I looked at what um, if you increased the cost of goods sold to 30% and you decreased the owner's um, drawn salary to 25000 which was what the assessor had been basing it on, um, how much would the sales have reduced um, to get to the break-even figure? And it was to 70% of what was in the, um, the cash flow forecast. Thank you. Ms. Gibson, nothing for Commissioner. There is just something I think that arises out of those yeah. questions from Dr. Collins. And I just want to avoid us debating this in closing. Ms. Gibson, Dr. Collins asked you some questions about whether you had formed a view looking at the overall file as to whether this demonstrated the care and skill of a prudent and diligent banker. And you referred to the level of errors and you said you accept that there's human beings are involved, there are going to be errors that are made. And then you said, but having regard to the overall level, level of errors on your review of this file, you weren't comfortable. Is that a fair summary of the things you, the points you made a moment ago? Yes. And what might just be lost there is Dr. Collins thought that you had answered his initial question, which is, do you think ANZ has demonstrated the care and skill of a prudent and diligent banker in this case by saying yes? That is, you do think that ANZ has demonstrated the care and skill of a prudent and diligent banker in this case? And then you went on to explain this issue about errors. So can I just ask you the question again? Do you think that in this case, ANZ has demonstrated the care and skill of a prudent and diligent banker? No. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Gibson. Uh, you may step down and you're excused, I think, further attendance. Uh, Mr Hodge, where to from here? Commissioner, the next witness will be Mr. Welsh again, could we so break again, for 10 minutes? So again, we're changing we'll... at the bar table. If I come back uh, shortly before quarter to midday. Thank you, Commissioner.